Dear eTwinner, happy eTwinning Day. Happy Europe Day. For this specific occasion, we have a very special guest, the European Commissioner for Innovation, Research, Culture, Education and News, Maria Gabriel. Commissioner Gabriel, thank you for joining us this day uh, for eTwinning and European Union and giving us the perspective of eTwinning. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really very, very pleased to be with you on this 16th eTwinning day. And uh, as you said, this is not any day, this is Europe Day. And it, this has a built-in message to you all, the eTwinning community, because you are participating in a great European success story. eTwinning, as part of Erasmus+, Plus, is founded on values that unite us all. European cooperation, inclusion, access to quality education for all, and strong contribution now to the green and digital transitions. And to achieve this, I'm really so pleased to see first that our new Erasmus Plus program that will run from 21 to 27 is substantially strengthened because you know that it has an overall budget of more than 26 billion euros, complemented by more than 2 billion from funds from external instruments, which means almost a doubling compared to the previous Erasmus Plus program. And why I'm, I'm talking about budgets, it's not about an amount of money. It is a clear recognition of the importance of education and training and of the need to step up opportunities for exchanges and learning mobility, be it physical or on-site or online or even blended. And e-training is a key tool to foster these exchanges and turn them into a high quality experiences. This is all the more so as the new Erasmus Plus gives a strong boost to further mobility for school pupils and staff. And specifically with respect to the e-training platform after 15 years, we'll soon revamp it into a single integrated platform with the current school education gate well and this will greatly facilitate access to information and actions to all school education stakeholders in relations to their perspective profiles and offer a new state-of-the-art platform to better accompany you in your daily work. You are showing a great interest for it winning. What is about it winning uh, in your eyes and what special message you would like to send on this specific day to it winners? First, a big thank you because each winning would not be a with it winning without the fantastic dedication and enthusiasm of the it winning community i'm so thankful to every one of you for that of course this was a very difficult year and i understand that many of you are facing challenges now with the school closures and distance and online learning and believe me you can count on our support still and all the more in these challenging times, I'm impressed to see just how much of a difference each winning can make. It provides you educators with a dynamic European community where you can find resources and ideas. It offers you the opportunity to share and exchange practices with your peers, including on how to cope with difficult circumstances. It can also be part of your professional development. And yes, for me, eTwinning is a powerful learning experience where students engage in collaborative work. And this is how people embrace new perspectives, learning from each other. And it is a great example of how cooperation between schools can help to address big societal challenges in very concrete and creative ways because Yes, allow me just to, to, to, to point out some numbers. Over the past 16 years, more than 920,000 teachers joined the platform and they collaborated on more than 120,000 projects. Behind these numbers is the sense of community that makes each winning unique. And I'm also pleased by the high quality of your projects many of those awarded with quality labels and prizes. And I also wish to express my deep appreciation for the 2,935 schools which have recently been granted the each winning school label 21-22, a label rewarding a collective effort 
and commitment of school leaders and staff to embedding e-training in their school's policies and practices. This sense of dialogue, collaboration, exchange, curiosity that you demonstrate every day is what makes e-training such a valuable tool. Thank you very much. That's really encouraging. And as you mentioned, eTwinning is a digital platform that enables collaboration, building mutual respect. And in 2021, we decided for the annual team to go on media literacy and combating this disinformation. And in this light, uh, how do you see eTwinning promoting this very topic? Well, thank you very much for this question because this is a crucial challenge of our time and one to which I'm deeply committed. Just uh, last September, I presented the new Digital Education Action Plan, and this plan outlines the European vision for digital education for the next seven years. And we may ask ourselves when reading a news, is this information trustworthy? Does it come from, from a trusted source? Should this be shared further? And these are questions that might feel overwhelming even threatening to our citizens and perhaps especially to our young people. And teachers here for me have a central guiding role in leading their pupils on the journey towards media literacy. And with eTwinning, we have great tool to support you in this effort. By its very collaborative nature, eTwinning is fantastic for innovative teaching methods and for exploring innovative pedagogical concepts. And by doing this in the context of transnational projects, pupils gain a multiplicity of perspectives, especially useful in breaking echo chambers. This is why I thought it was important for me to launch the spring campaign that for an entire month focused on how to be smart online. And it included a webinar with the eTwinning Friends slide detectors. Of course, I do not expect teachers to solve by themselves the complex issues of disinformation and online literacy. Given the complexity of the problem, there is no single solution. A multidimensional approach is needed, which includes transparency of online news, pluralism, independence of the media, development of tools to verify content, and you know that many commission services are working hard on this. And it is important to never let our guards off and always question the source. Teachers are important relays in these collective efforts. And I'm sure that together we really can empower our young people to have the critical thinking, to have the choice and to thrive in the new digital era. And it winners have welcomed your commitment. Earlier, you mentioned already it winning school labels, uh, it winning prize winners, but there is another very important pillars within the it winning community, which are it winning ambassador. Do you have a word for them? Indeed. Another special thanks to the more than 1,400 it winning ambassadors. Yes, for me, ambassadors are pillars of it winning. They are devoted, enthusiastic, and eager to share their experience in running e twinning projects with the community. And they are active promoters of e twinning disseminating its benefits and assisting other e twinners with pedagogical and technical issues, collaborating in trainings and variety of activities. So for me, it's extremely valuable their work. I must say that e twinning ambassadors collaborate also with the e twinning national support organizations that nominate them and work with them on various national activities. And uh, yes, for me, they are embodying with great generosity the spirit of it winning, of engagement, innovation, sharing for the benefit of their students, and ultimately for all of us as European society. Thank you very much, Commissioner Gabriel, for these encouraging words and also for your commitment uh, within it winning. We look forward to continuing our joint work specifically on this annual theme, media literacy, but also on many other it winning activities. So once again, happy it winning day, happy Europe day. Thank you.
First of all, it's always a pleasure to, to be in the house of the European history. This exhibition, I'm impressed. I'm impressed by the extraordinary work, by the extraordinary number of examples in order to show that the phenomenon of fake news or disinformation is not something new. I see here a real scientific approach, how important it is to listen to experts. And finally, I'm determined. I'm determined to continue together with, uh, with all the actions within my portfolio, touching to the role of education for media literacy and disinformation to continue to take actions and to do it together with experts, with teachers, with young people, with the entire society. We need always to take into consideration the context, how this, this is evolving and to check the resources. It's very, very important because we can see that sometimes even in our history there is important facts that are uh, fake news. What I like very much is the interactive manner to to transmit knowledge, the, to, to have it as a game, for example, for our children. And we know that it's another way to touch more people, to bring more attention to this topic, showing how important it is on one side to have the lessons learned from our history, but on the other side, yes, to bring younger generation, the next generation, in a more innovative and more interactive way. Teachers have a crucial role to play here because teachers are those that really can make understand our young people what that means, critical thinking, to make informed choice. And then the other side, uh, teachers, they need too, to have access to different skills, to different tools. And that's why e-training is so important. On one side, teachers can exchange best practices, can have access to online materials, to innovative pedagogies. And on the other side, they are the best way really to touch our young people and to make them understand that here you have tools at your disposal. It's up to you to make your informed choice. And that's very, very encouraging. And that's why I count very much on retraining. Education is not the only solution, but we need to strengthen first the role of education. That's why I'm very glad that now we'll create a new expert group in order to, to develop guidelines about the role of education for tackling this information. That's a very important message and it's part of our digital education action plan and is part of our European education area. There is no contradiction between fundamental principles and values like freedom of expression or access to information and the transparency and the responsibility. And of course, everyone has a role to play from teachers to pupils, from platforms to the advertising sector. We work with all the stakeholders in this ecosystem by paying special attention to the human-centered approach. And again, here, the role of education is crucial. Welcome to the E-Training Annual Conference 2021. Dear trainers, dear friends, time has come for the Training Annual Conference 2021, the theme Media Literacy and Disinformation. The Annual Conference is the highlight of the year where trainers gather to learn, share, connect with each other and celebrate their many achievements. As usual, we prepare a full range of activities, keynotes, workshops, opportunities to network, all to provide you with a great experience. Although we're not together physically, we are sure we'll keep the spirit of the training alive. How are we going to work? There are three points that you need to pay attention to. The website of the conference, the program, and the virtual exhibition. The website of the conference contains all the information you need prior to and during the event. It is a space dedicated to the teachers that were invited to attend the conference. Please check the welcome page where you will find the, the program and other relevant information, such as the event guidelines. You can also check the other pages regarding the different sessions for more details on the keynotes, panel session, workshops, etc. Check the program to be sure you are always on time and pay attention to your time zone. All timings are in Brussels time. We have prepared a virtual exhibition where you can explore the theme of the conference and take the opportunity to network with the other participants 
exchange and learn from each other, have fun and also enjoy a virtual coffee. Lastly, from the first to the last day, we will be sending you daily email messages. These email messages contain important information and reminders. For example, the links to the workshops that you've chosen and your networking group. So please pay careful attention to those messages and read them every day. For any aspect that may not seem so clear or any other question you may have, please do not hesitate to contact us or use the support forum. We will do our best to answer your questions as soon as possible. Now we invite you to explore the conference website and see you soon. Dear tweeners, dear participants, dear teachers and viewers of this live stream, welcome to the eTwinning Annual Conference 2021. My name is Christos and I will be your host for the first part of tonight's event. We are once more online, as you can see, from our studio in Brussels and uh, my colleagues already informed me that we have almost hundreds of people watching us and we would like to thank you for this heartwarming support. Please be reminded that during this session, but also during the conference, you can also follow and comment on social media using the hashtag ETWConf21. Our theme this year is media literacy and disinformation, making the difference with it winning. And one would think, is it really necessary nowadays in 2021 to discuss about media literacy? Well, in order to answer this question, we need to go back in time and remember uh, that 2020 and 2021 were the years that we reconnected the most with our beds, sofas and couches, and inevitably so with our screens. And during these two years, I could not just stop from remembering when my mother used to tell me that I will not accomplish anything in life by laying in bed all day and watching a screen. And there you are. This is what we actually did for two consecutive years. And by doing so, we managed not only to protect our loved ones, but also part of the extended community. At the same time, only two years of the coronavirus pandemic was enough, unfortunately, to reveal that many Europeans are worryingly prone to believe conspiracy theories. Somehow, it became easier to convince people that Dostoevsky wrote the lyrics to Oops, I did it again, rather than that vaccines save lives. What a ridiculous thought. In a weird way, real information became rare, whereas fake information was abandoned and convenient. That is why this year, to talk about media literacy, it is very imperative. Um, because we need to remind to tweeners and to the people that real information is accessible, it is priceless, and most importantly, it liberates us from fear. And this is what happened with it winning. Um, when social media were full of fake news, it winning equipped you with the right tools to intercept these fake news and neutralize them. It winners, this year you amazed us with your adaptability, resourcefulness, perseverance. And this year, this conference, as every conference, is dedicated to you. Now, during the next days, the participants of this conference will have the opportunity to attend workshops, networking activities, and plenaries and we'll have the opportunity to network and feel part again of the big eTwinning community. At the same time, this live stream is accessible to all with the hope that we are going to enlarge our eTwinning family. This evening, we have prepared for you an exciting event during which you will receive a warm welcome from Themis Christofidou, Director General for Education, Youth, 
sport and culture of the European Commission. One more warm welcome from the national support organizations of eTwinning. And then a very inspiring keynote address by Zeynep Tufeksi. After the keynote address, you will be dismissed for about 15 minutes, during which you will go refresh yourselves, and then we would like you to come back for the eTwinning European Prize Award ceremony presented by Irini Pateraki. Not to forget, for the next few days, we have prepared for you a virtual exhibition hall dedicated to the eTwinning annual theme, Media Literacy and Disinformation. In this exhibition, you will find all the highlights of this year, but also new materials and resources that we hope will inspire you for your future projects. Um, but now it's time to open finally officially the conference and give the floor to Themis Christofidou, Director General for Education, Youth, Sport and Culture of the European Commission, who has prepared for you a video message. Let's watch it. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Commissioner Maria Gabriel, who unfortunately could, could not be with you today, I would like to welcome you all to our annual eTwinning conference. Even the work of the greatest teachers can be further enhanced if we find a way to connect, to exchange, and to coordinate. Technology gives us this opportunity, and through our tool eTwinning, we get to leverage the resources from all over Europe to support your work connecting classrooms. This is European level coordination acting at the local level, bottom up. This year's theme illustrates this to a great extent. Media literacy and disinformation is such a difficult issue to tackle. We need citizens to develop their ability to critically understand and interact with media. Our democracy depends on it. Of course, if we're going to tackle an issue that is so reliant on understanding different perspectives, a tool like eTwinning will shine. What better way to learn different points of view and break echo chambers than to have contact with them, learning with colleagues from another country? What better way to develop critical thinking than to discuss across borders how different media portray events and why. These skills have only become more important with the digital transformation we are currently undergoing. And as classrooms become more digitized and teachers more digitally empowered, schools became a natural setting. Indeed, teachers have a central role to play in this mission. Its very collaborative nature means e-tweening e is excellent for adopting and developing innovative teaching methods as well as exploring innovative pedagogical concepts. And e-tweening has a proven track record on this issue. Take Digital Bridge, for example. This project brings together 30 classes from 10 countries in and around the EU aiming at helping students become better digital citizens and be aware of cyber risks. Students have developed a variety of tools from a quiz on why people create fake news to a digital citizenship dictionary or an e-magazine on safer internet. Last spring, we saw more than 8,000 e-tweeners join the campaign group for media, media literacy and disinformation, not to mention the more than 1,400 eTwinners that participated in the eTwinning Weeks 2021 campaign, working and inspiring each other to create new projects on media literacy and disinformation. Dear friends, these are impressive results. We should all be proud. Today, we are publishing the 2021 eTwinning book on teaching media literacy and fighting disinformation. This can be a useful reference featuring many amazing projects you developed. After all, media literacy is not something we solve in a year. It is an ongoing issue, and your work will continue to inspire many classrooms across Europe over time. As for next year, our annual theme for eTwinning will be 
schools and one of our flagship initiatives, the new European Bauhaus. The Bauhaus is all about changing our space to fit our needs and address the challenges we face, like sustainability and inclusion. And schools are extremely important spaces when these discussions, where these discussions can blossom. This theme should have many synergies with the new Erasmus Plus program priorities, from inclusion and diversity to the green and digital transitions, and of course, with the European Year of Youth. In 2022, the eTwinning community will be empowered with the launch of a new integrated European school education platform. The new platform will streamline your journeys as users and deduplicate content and functionalities of the existing two platforms, eTwinning and the School Education Gateway. Of course, we're taking great care that your experience as eTwinners will be preserved. Our aim is to build on it, improve it, not to change course. With this, I leave the stage to you, wishing you a great conference ahead. Thank you. Many thanks to Director General Femis Christofidou for her kind words and the active support she shows to the participants of eTwinning. Now, for those who don't know, the national support organizations are actually the backbone of eTwinning. Among the many things they do, well, they do many things. They are those to whom you turn to when you need support, and they are the ones who organize eTwinning um, national events, as well as they are the ones that they give national quality labels and many more things. They support like the whole country network. And today, they have prepared for you a very important message. So let's watch what they have prepared for us. We're looking forward to meeting you all during the next three days. This year, the eTwinning community has been focused on two sides of the same coin, media literacy and how to tackle the phenomenon of disinformation and fake news. eTwinning has been promoting media literacy since its birth in 2005 by focusing on the integration of digital tools in everyday life of teachers and students. Special emphasis has been given to digital citizenship with the aim of fostering students' awareness and responsibility in using the internet and its tools. This year, we further discovered these topics via specific projects, online events and collaboration opportunities. You have involved students, colleagues and your schools in this adventure. 2021 has not been an easy year. But you exceeded the expectations by showing resilience, creativity, and supporting each other. And that is what makes you a winner. Today, we will begin our conference, which will engage 500 fellow community eTwinning members, experts in the field, members of the support community, and of the European Commission. During these days, you will discover something new to share with your students and colleagues and meet your schools ready to this complex information society. And of course, you'll find new friends among the 500 participants of the conference. We will be here to help and guide you on this exciting journey the opportunities of media literacy and the challenges of disinformation. Many thanks to the national support organizations of eTwinning. We really do love our NSOs. Now, we have one more video to show to you, and this is about our friends. And when I say friends, I mean the friends of eTwinning. Our friends are bodies, organizations, and initiatives that share the same values and the objectives of eTwinning. The collaboration between eTwinning and its friends aims to share their expertise to teachers through online seminars, workshops, and disseminating high-quality material. Let's get to know them.
it's good to have friends. Now, I'm particularly excited and delighted to present Zeynep Tufeksi. Zeynep Tufeksi is a columnist for the New York Times and a visiting associate professor at the University of Columbia. Her work revolves around the intersection of society, technology, and science. Zeynep, welcome. We are very happy to have you with us, and we are eager to hear what you have prepared for us today. The floor is all yours. Thank you, and thank you, Christos, for the kind introduction. It is my pleasure to be addressing one of the uh, most important topics, I believe, for the 21st century, which is how do we go about educating and teaching the next generation on what media literacy and critical literacy would look like given the digital environment. So to frame this conversation, the first thing I wanna talk about is the difference between what my generation understood to be media literacy and critical thinking and how some of those features of how we do this or how we should do this ideally uh, differ from the way it was. And then we will use that as the framework for trying to think through how we could do this and how we could do this better. So a lot of times, when we think about media literacy or critical thinking, we think about doing research, being skeptical of claims, trying to find authoritative sources, and trying to understand the world and the information we hear by having a critical, researching, interested eye and wading through the information and different claims. Now, when I was a kid, if somebody said, go do your research, the only kind of research I could do was to go to libraries or to books or to encyclopedias, which most of the time was what it meant in my particular case, uh, even when I was in high school, because I grew up in Turkey. We didn't even have internet back then. Uh, it came to Turkey fairly late. But even if you were in someplace else in the world, a lot of times it meant looking at a physical book or an encyclopedia. Now, those things may not be perfect, but they are gatekept, meaning they have been edited. There's a process by which things can appear in a book or um, especially an encyclopedia. That doesn't mean there were no books with fraudulent claims or incorrect things or things that had been superseded, but essentially there was a really shortage of what it meant in terms of where one could go. Now, these days, if you say to someone, go do your research, especially to younger audiences, one of the most sort of primary resources they end up at is YouTube. They will do their research, not even on Google, directly the search bar, not necessarily on Wikipedia, um, not a lot of these other sources, but a lot of them will go to YouTube. And in some ways, there's a lot of interesting thing on YouTube. I learned stuff there. I'm you know, able to sort of go through those things. And it's not like it's a terrible resource if you know what you're doing. But, and here's the but, if it's on a topic that you don't already have a substantive amount of knowledge. There is also an enormous amount of misleading, fake, fraudulent, incorrect, but very attractive and very well designed material that has been made to look scientific and research. And in some cases, some of those things are hosted by people seemingly with the right credentials. Sometimes those people do exist. There are people with the right credentials who are uh, hosting shows that are making claims that go against the consensus of a scientific field. So if you're a young person and if you don't have independent, substantive knowledge of the field, it's really hard to distinguish what looks like a person with the right credential making scientific claims from an actual scientific knowledge that reflects the consensus of the field, whatever the question that you're researching. 
This didn't really used to be like that. Part of the problem, again, is that in the past, if you wanted to fake an encyclopedia, that was not an easy thing. I mean, I guess you could, um, you know, purchase printers and print a fake encyclopedia, but then you'd have to get it to libraries. That wasn't really a feasible thing. Now, the other thing that happens once you are on a place like YouTube, where you're doing your research, is that the algorithm of the whole place and the design of the whole place is geared towards keeping people on that site. Now, when you do research, your goal is to do your research and be done, right? With an encyclopedia, when you go to one, here's your research. And like the whole idea is to get to that page, read that page and be done. Whereas on social media, on, uh, on those sites, the goal of that site is to keep you there. So it is, well, you watch that video. How about this next one? And how about this other one? And how about this other one? Of varying qualities in uh, accuracy and very often sensational, interesting, but incorrect things are quite appealing. So just telling people, do your research, it is just as likely to mislead them than it is to make them find an actual credible source and evaluate that one within the context of competing ones that are also available uh, on the internet. And the other thing that we used to teach young people uh, was to be skeptical. And that's not a bad thing in some broad sense, but what I find very often with young audiences today is that they learn how to be skeptical before they learn what to trust. I have seen them question things that are very clearly and obviously true because they thought just questioning everything is how you're skeptical. So in some ways, before they could even learn what it meant to be part of a knowledge community, obtain substantive knowledge and learn things, they have learned to be skeptical, which means that they can't also figure out what to trust. And I think literacy, media literacy, and scientific critical thinking nowadays is just as much about figuring out what's trustworthy as it is figuring out what is not and what is to be suspicious of. And that puts us in a bind because especially if you're educating younger audiences, younger uh, generation and students, they don't have the substantive tools to make those judgments. They cannot just go on YouTube and they can't even go on Wikipedia per se, even though Wikipedia is a much better resource for them than almost anything else they're going to encounter on their own in my experience. The Wikipedia is the best choice among many uh, other things they will use instead. Uh, they can't wade through the claims by using any of the traditional tools we tell them. Look for credentials, look for authoritative figures, look for scientific facts, because everything that's out there is making, many of the things out there are making the same things. They are saying, we are science, and they are saying, we have people with PhDs and sometimes they do. They really are because the world is large. If you have a million people with PhDs on a field, you can find one of them saying something that goes completely against the scientific consensus, but they have the credentials. So how do we approach this? I think one of the things we need to try to communicate is humility in understanding that do your research is not really a productive path forward unless you are able to match substantive knowledge to understand and wait through that research. If you can't judge the claims because you have no knowledge of the field, then it is really, I think, um, impossible just to say do your research the way a lot of literacy teaching used to do. The other thing is, uh, instead of sort of teaching them how to be skeptical of everything, I feel like we should try to teach 
um, students two things. And one of them is there are authorities, scientific authorities that you can trust. That doesn't mean everything they say at any given moment is 100% correct, but they're within the field of science where they strive to be correct and they try to get at the truth. And sometimes, yes, they make mistakes, but they will strive to correct it. And sometimes there's new knowledge. They will move forward. So the scientific process definitely moves forward, but it doesn't mean everything you read from actual scientific authoritative sources is necessarily wrong at any point. It means that you should start by trusting it unless of course you learn, you know, some things have gotten better and you have some substantive knowledge of the field. So I'm sort of suggesting reversing the pedagogical approach in some ways and starting with teaching young students how to seek those authoritative sources without being unrealistic about the fact that sometimes, yes, the authoritative sources, it doesn't mean like there's uh, they're 100%. It means that it's a process, but here's where you can trust and learn that the rest of whatever's going on, some of it may be within scientific disagreement, some of it may be charlatans. But a high school student cannot be expected to easily distinguish what is the charlatan or grift part or and what is scientific disagreement? And I think I find that uh, it's even hard for um, adults because you know there's all these, of course it's hard for adults because there's a lot of specialization needed to try to distinguish what is scientific disagreement within a field and what is claims that are just completely out of left field and are not trustworthy and are being, um, proposed and put forward by people who are fraudulent, attention-seeking, grifters, or just completely wrong. There, there might be contrarians, and there's a lot of that. And the other thing that I think is really useful is empowering young people in understanding what this layout means, explaining to them that there will be people on YouTube with the right credentials, seemingly scientific debate. That's not really what it seems. And they also can be educated about the algorithms and the design of those sites, which are trying to keep you there. They're not there to get you to your answer and help you log off, which is what the true process would look like if it was serving us but they're there to try to keep us with the recommendations and what they serve and what they don't serve. And uh, it's not something that they can, not only can they not trust it, they should learn to mistrust it because that is not a place where you can get to what you need to get to unless you already know what you need to know. So this is a tricky thing to try to teach. And it is also a thing where um, we need to, I think, re-emphasize how important substantive knowledge is. It's not just the process. Very often, I remember when I would be taught about the scientific process in high school back then, um, we would have these charts, hypothesis, hypothesis testing, is it falsified, new hypothesis. It was this um, step-by-step um, sort of explanation that really favored the process as an explanation. It's the same thing with statistics. The way I, I've taught statistics myself and the way we usually teach it is step by step. Here's a p-value. Here's how you find it. Here's what you do it. And in actual scientific practice, the process is very heavily weighted with substantive knowledge. There are people, scientists, working scientists, don't look at every hypothesis with equal distance because they have existing knowledge of the field. They understand where things may go wrong. When a statistician looks at some results, there's all these questions about why they may or may not be biased. There's a lot of, which, but, which depends on understanding the question at hand. So if you're doing, say, ecology or zoology or biology or sociology, or any one of those fields, the process 
The step-by-step -step process is at every step informed by knowledge of the field itself. It's informed by the content. And the better the process and the content is intertwined, I think the stronger the kind of scientific process you get. And this is not something that just the process alone, no matter how many steps you think you follow, uh, can replicate. So when I go on um, today, these days, when I look at social media, I look at uh, YouTube, I look at a lot of other things, I see a lot of scientific looking videos and claims that mimic this process exactly to appear scientific and to appeal, especially to young people, but also to adults as if they're part of the scientific process. But if you know the underlying substance of the field are not scientifically based, the content isn't there, the process looks right. It's almost like they're cooking, but with fake ingredients, right? If you don't understand the point of the ingredients, if you don't understand what, why we cook with fat or what a fat soluble uh, flavor is and is not, like just following the steps does not get you to what you, where you need to get. So um, what I've noticed is that this is a huge, in my experience, this is a huge stumbling block because especially at the K-12, like in elementary school and high school, we're trying to teach kids, young students who do not have that substantive knowledge, how to navigate a world that is often set up for them to fail because the design of the internet and design, especially of social media platforms and the ones like YouTube, where they're going to go for their research, is not designed to help them navigate this successfully. So what are some of the things we can do? I feel like telling them don't go on YouTube is not a very productive way because they are going to go on YouTube. But we can try to convince them what the pitfalls are, I think, by being there with them and accompanying them on this process to try to explain to them how easy it is to be fooled and how easy it is to fall for these traps that have been set for us very often by other content providers who are just either ideological or grifting or just want attention and how the design of these sites and algorithms sets us up to fail. To give an example, uh, one of the ways in which uh, for, if this is an example from another field, one of the examples that I use when I'm trying to teach digital security to people like journalists who work in these things, and they often get told, you know, don't click on links you don't know and don't fall for phishing. They're given these instructions, but of course the instructions don't work because, you know, how do you do your work if you never open an attachment or click on a link, right? The instructions are unrealistic. And people feel bad because they think they can't really do it because they think, oh, I failed to follow the instructions. But in fact, the instructions aren't followable because the standard just isn't doable. So I tell them how engineers at Google, who are as like technical as you can get, have been successfully fished by foreign adversaries who were looking to get into their accounts because they can't follow the, those instructions either. And in fact, because of that, Google and other companies have developed other methods. They don't just tell people, oh, don't click on links because that doesn't really work. So I tell people this exactly so I can try to convince them to do things in another way rather than trying to follow instructions that is just not doable. So I feel like just telling, so, so to compare this to this topic, I feel like telling young students don't go on YouTube, they're going to go on YouTube. So what we need to do is instead of, or just don't fall for non-authoritative sources, well, they can't tell them apart. That's the problem. Instead, I think we need to show them how easy it is to fall for all this by doing this with them, like sit down with them and say, all right, let's do this research the way you'd normally actually do it. And you'll find that they're going to end up in all sorts of sources and some of them are going to look really, really authoritative. Some of them are going to look really scientific. Some of them are going to look like 
we're helping you do your research because that's how they frame it. Like this is how current misinformation is very often framed as, you know, helping people do their research and show them how it's just not easy to navigate. So the real path is to start knowing where to start. And that's starting with the authoritative sources, not like just sort of doing random research and assuming that as your first approach, the scientific, like if it's public health, it's the public health authorities. If it's science, it's the scientific um, associations. It's the, it's not the individuals, but it's that collective process that will get us closer to the kind of answers we need to get, at least the best answers we have at the time. Now, of course, what I just said also requires um, the society to be organized around this, because right now, a lot of uh, scientific associations and scientific authorities, they've stepped up in some ways, but they haven't really fully realized that what they need to do is the, be in these spaces with the kind of answers people need, with the kind of accessible um, presentation, but with the understanding that they're going to be competing with a lot of people who look the same, and make similar claims and have some credentials. But the difference is we're going to say, let's say on some um, scientific topic, the Chemical Engineers Association is the right place to start from. Now, when we do that, what sometimes one of the things that happens is that the people who would like to mislead or are misinformed or just suspicious will say, well, here's a thing they got wrong in the past. And that's true, that happens. Uh, it's not scientific authorities are not infallible. And I think we should just straight up acknowledge that they may not be infallible, but as a person who's not an expert in that field, and as the person who hasn't put in an enormous amount of time trying to wait through all of this, our best bet as an individual is to go to these authorities and these collective authorities that are supposed to review the state of science and say, here's our best state of knowledge. So they need to produce more of this. And we need to sort of direct people to more of this. And I think direct them away from do your own research. Because by itself, it sounds good. But in practice, it's like you're doing your research in a maze that's been designed to trip you up. I feel somewhat uncomfortable saying some of this because do your own research is how I cut my teeth when I was growing up. But as I said back then, the gatekeeping was a very um, different situation. We couldn't just sort of, we weren't set up like this. So we need to challenge the current moment, the current status quo, and empower people, especially young people, but empower them in a truthful, honest, vulnerable way. Yes, things do get wrong by scientific authorities aren't infallible, but you are more fallible as a person compared to them. Now they will point to people who have um, defied scientific authorities and have been correct. And that happens. That's very true. It happens. But it is once again, unlikely to be just a student or just a normal random adult kind of just making some guesses. That kind of challenge within science disagreement takes a lot of work and knowledge and substantive work. And so once again, it goes to teaching humility, not just empowerment. In fact, I think of humility in the limits of knowledge and limits of what we can and cannot say as a crucial way of empowering people to eventually do what we call do your own research because it is as much picking the sources to trust as it is to start from scratch and try to reach conclusions that we're not equipped to uh, answer ourselves. So posing the right questions and finding the answer is very important. And very often, I think that requires, besides teaching this, teaching about institutions. 
So uh, I remember one incident where um, I showed a photograph to um, I think a third or fourth grader uh, about something. I'm not exactly sure right now. I'll have to think. Uh, but it was that age group. And the reaction, it was a photograph that looked spectacular about mountain climbers. And the reaction was, oh, this must be fake because they had just learned about Photoshop. So their class had learned about fake photographs and how easily they could be altered and how uh, all of this was possible. And it looks like a good thing to teach, but they hadn't learned that not everything is fake. So their immediate reaction was, oh, it must be fake. This photograph had been published in the New York Times. So what we need to teach students is not that New York Times or any other newspaper is infallible, but for photographs, there's a very strict process. If a photographer uh, is caught altering a news photograph, they will get fired. Even if it's a minor little alteration, um, like if they remove an, if, in fact, there was an example like that, an Associated Press photographer removed from the frame like a little camera had stuck into the frame. It was completely irrelevant to the picture. It just looked a little, like it was jotting from the corner and all he did was just sort of take it out. And that was it. End of um, his job as a photographer, even though he had been um, a very high level photographer. And he was like, it was an innocent mistake. It was not some malicious thing. It was just an innocent oversight, but that is not allowed. There's a process by which news organizations have developed. There are things called like raw uh, files for photographs, which show all the um, very deep level detail, which can help us detect if they've been altered. Um, so there's a lot of these institutional process in check. So if you look at a photograph as a regular person, I don't think I have the... Um, tools to tell if it's fake or not. Like I have no such, a picture could look, I mean, obviously if something's like completely, um, if you have cats or dogs flying in the sky, you're like, yeah, this is fake. But there's a lot of photographs that look perfectly realistic, but are fake. And there's a lot of pictures that look stunning and you think surely this is fake and they're not. So the difference, the, so what we need to teach children, I think is not that you need to be suspicious of photographs, but what are the institutional processes by which these photographs are vetted? And what are some of the ways in which we know which institutions we can trust? And this is also true for things like open source, what we call open source for photographs, where it's not taken by a professional photographer, but it's taken by, say, a citizen somewhere, and they are um, just being used news organizations, and there are other uh, institutions now dedicated to do this, have a very detailed, complicated process and an expertise which tries to figure out, is this photograph real? And is it from the time? They will check the weather. They will check if there are other photographs of that same place. If there are multiple angles, they will check all the angles. They'll try to find other sources. They'll try to verify you know, what they can with the raw data. There's some automated tools. There are reverse engineering sites and things like that. So instead of just starting teaching kids, don't trust photographs, they can be fake which just makes them suspicious of everything. And suspicion is not knowledge. Suspicion can lead people into conspiracy theories unless it is bolstered by substantive knowledge and certain breaks on when you know you're going off too far. Um, I think what we should try to teach them is like, okay, there are ways in which we do verify things and then we need to understand which institutions do what kind of work in this space and which ones we know uh, we can trust. And also be honest, like even if they fail, which happens 
from time to time, they're still trying to get it right. They're trying to do the right thing. They are trying to correct. So as a process, they are much better equipped than an individual to try to uh, get at all of this. So as you can see, I'm talking a lot about the process by which society operates and how institutions operate and how YouTube and its algorithms operate, and also how Wikipedia operates to try to empower people to figure out what they can trust, rather than sending them out into the world and saying, oh, be suspicious of things and do your own research. And by the way, there's a lot of fake stuff out there. Because what happens is they, they start thinking some of the actual stuff is fake. They get so suspicious that Everything looks false. And that itself is also misinformation, right? The idea that we can't know, say, safety of vaccines and it's complete unknown, for example, is not true. Like people put an enormous amount of effort to figure out such questions. So what we can do is we can try to educate people on what that process looks like. But we don't need to tell, especially like high school students, that they can read a complicated scientific paper and develop their own personal judgment without a lot of substantive knowledge in that very field. Science is not just process. Science is also facts. Science is also a practice. It's substantive knowledge. It's not just, you know, let me just read this and kind of have an open mind. Science is not just pure open mind. In fact, the whole point of science is to say, these things are not what's happening. Science teaches you to close your mind to certain things that are not scientific. So open-minded uh, without that kind of grounding, if anything, I think can be um, misleading and disempowering because it leaves people confused and suspicious and unable to figure out what to believe. And in fact, uh, in 21st century, censorship is very often carried out by trying to confuse people, by trying to undermine credibility of sources and institutions that should be credible. And it is done by just drowning people in so much information that they just give up. They just say, like, I don't know what to do. And to fight against that, from our education to the way our institutions operate, we need to forefront that credibility. That's the most essential, um, that's the most essential important um, attribute that institutions have that we need to defend. Now, one of the challenges when I say all of this, and this is, I'm sure you're thinking about it as I speak, uh, is the fact that our institutions aren't perfect. And in fact, we've seen throughout the pandemic and other things that they occasionally make mistakes. And I feel like we need to give this message that they're still to be trusted but that it's a process where things occasionally do go wrong, but also as a society recognize that making sure those institutions work well and are credible and retain their credibility is the most important thing society can do to aid educators who are trying to empower students to find things they can trust. Because instead of teaching them not to trust, we're trying to teach them how to find the thing that they can trust, which means that it's essential that those things both exist and retain very retain their credibility and uh, work hard at doing all of this. So um, I've sort of come through, like I've given some um, ideas on how to deal with this. And none of these are um, like exact prescriptions, but I think one of the most important takeaways for me in dealing with this kind of process, because I'm an educator too, I've been teaching, I teach at the college level, but occasionally because of my research and other reasons, I uh, interact with um, 
younger students that I know many of you educate, but also college students have the same, you know, they're not immune from any of this either. And what I have found most useful most of the time is to walk through this maze that I've described with them, right? Instead of giving them instructions that may feel a little too abstract at times, I try to say, all right, let's look this up. And um, in feels like aviation and feels like, um, like other sort of high risk fields, there's something called a no blame postmortem. If something goes wrong or if there's a near miss, people sit down and say, this is not, we're not gonna blame you. Tell us what went wrong. All right, so I feel like instead of trying to send students to find the right answer and then grading them on whether or not they found the right answer, because that process is gonna fail as much as succeed. Uh, the finding the right answer isn't what we're trying to teach them. We're trying to teach them the process by which they're more likely to succeed or not. Feel like we should do these process walkthroughs where we say, all right, we're not like judging what you're doing. We are learning together to navigate this maze. And we sit down with them and we ask them to do the research and we go through it and we say, all right, how would you go about it? And let them type it into Google. Look at the links. Let them type it into YouTube. Look at what comes up. Watch those things. Uh, see when uh, the credentialed misinformation comes up. See how to figure out, can we tell what these people are? See how we could try to get better at, try to recognize how the design of the site is working. Try to understand what the recommendation algorithm on um, things like YouTube uh, is doing. Try to um, sort of navigate the space with them. And at first, of course, they're occasionally come up with the wrong answer, right? I mean, this is just adults can't navigate the space. 100% uh, of the time, young people learning about all of this are going to come up with the wrong answer in the wrong path, and they're going to be tripped up by this maze. And that we should just tell them that's part of the process. Like you, what you need to learn is how to get better at it. And if you just tell them, find the right answer, they just try, try, try. And occasionally they find the right answer. And we think, oh, they're fine. They're finding the right answer. It may be they just managed it this time, but they haven't completely internalized how this maze actually works, which is the more important lesson to learn. So I would love to have, you know, media literacy and scientific literacy classes that focused on, tell me your process. Let's sit through this together. What could have gone wrong? What could have misled us? How do we understand, uh, you know, where we are and all of those things in a non-judgmental way and focused on that kind of empowerment rather than, you know, did you find the right answer to say how far the moon is from Earth, right? They may be able to find that right answer at that time. But as soon as it gets to another question, the same method of the Google box was correct may not work because the Google box to these basic questions is often correct. It works, say, 80% of the time. I'm making this number up now, but oh, sometimes it really fails. So even if they find the right answer, it doesn't mean they understood what is happening. How is that Google box and the answer? How is that uh, pulled? And what is the process by which um, all of that is happening is in many ways, I think, more important than whether or not they got the right answer from the Google box you know, most of the time, because the moment it gets complicated or the topic moves from something like how far is the moon, which is less contested, there's less of the sort of efforts to mislead people, to something like are vaccines safe and effective, where there's an enormous effort to mislead people on that. So you need to kind of um, try to anticipate that. And plus, once again, on something like vaccine safety, you can't dismiss people's questions either because there are side effects and there are adverse events. Those things are real. That's why scientists and doctors and you know the whole field of public health spend so much time 
trying to figure these things out, right? Because it is a complicated question. So you have to concede that too. You can't just give glib answers. You can't just dismiss people because they become even more suspicious. So um, here's the positive part. Let me just kind of end on this. I think there has never been in some ways a better time to be informed. If you learn how to navigate this maze and if you feel empowered by the tools you acquire in your education, which is what we as educators want them to do, it's a wonderful world out there, right? There are so many actual scientists and critical thinkers and analysts and other people uh, who write their blogs, who explain things. There's these wonderful tools. There's just so much that can feed that amazing curiosity that students can have. But we have to recognize curiosity can be subverted and exploited, right? So what I want to do is hopefully find that way in which we preserve the value and the amazing power of that curiosity by teaching young people that there are people out to misinform you or get your attention or sell you something or mislead you exactly by appealing to your curiosity and your sense of research and your sense of interest. In fact, a lot of conspiracy theories that are baseless these days, they look like we were curious and we looked this stuff up and it looks like, you know, a lot of analytic thinking. It's just the substance isn't there. So um, it's a really bit like you know, for someone who likes cooking, you need to say, yes, but those ingredients are fake. And this is how you do great cooking and kind of teach the difference. I think that's what we're facing is that the very things that make learners successful are the very things that are being targeted by people, by algorithms, by platforms, by all of that. So we need to teach people what those targeting looks like and what that maze looks like exactly so they can get the benefit of having um, this much information available at their fingertips with this much good information. So, um, so I'm hopeful, like, I think this is kind of a adjustment and transition period, and we're going to figure this out, you know, how to do our education geared to this, but also, of course, we need to speak to, uh, societal institutions and say that we as educators need this kind of content, this kind of product, this kind of sort of um, process that the tools, the process needs has to come from uh, rest of society and scientific institutions and all of that too. Because if it's not there, well, how are we going to direct and teach to our students? And when all of that comes together, they are going to have more in their fingertips than any other, I, I mean, more than, I did more than any other generation in history almost. And that's just great. And that's just exciting. We just have to empower our students realistically with humility, with substance, by focusing on the process and by focusing on empowering them to navigate that process rather than anything that's just focused on results or multiple choice or any of that because even if they get through that that doesn't mean that they have learned the kind of process that will empower them and that is the best uh, result we can hope for is that when they they can navigate all this uh, more successfully as um, empowered adults in 21st century so thank you very much uh, for listening to all of this and I look forward to questions and a discussion. Thank you, Zainab. Um, in the beginning of this presentation, I actually said that, that the keynote address would be inspiring. Well, that was an understatement. Many thanks to Zainab. Um, let's take now a three minutes break because we need to digest all this information. We have also received some questions from you. So let's come back afterwards for a Q&A session and uh, three minutes break.
Hello, welcome from this uh, very, very short uh, break. And now we have some uh, questions, Zeynep. Uh, everybody was truly amazed by the, uh, by the keynote address. So um, we received actually a lot of questions revolving around the first thing this, that you actually spoke about how websites are designed by their algorithm to keep us there as long as possible. So the question is, how can education mobilize tech giants to build algorithms that do not promote business models, but human-friendly algorithms? So this is very difficult, and it goes uh, into the question of how do we regulate these things? And that is not something we as educators have a magic wand. We don't run the world. But I think what we can do and what we should do is try to make it clear both to parents but also to citizens and policymakers that this is a big issue, that this is not something as simple as saying to kids or young people, or oh, just go here or that, that until we address the public sphere and the information ecology and figure out how to fund and promote the healthier options that should exist, and also to try to curb some of the excesses of these engagement-driven algorithms, it's going to be like a maze and it's going to be very difficult. Like the things like the epistemic fractures and the misleading information that can easily be monetized or just sort of um, used for attention are going to be there. So we can't like make the tech companies do better, but to the degree that we can make the problem prominent and obvious, maybe that can bring some legislation. And in some cases we might be able to team up with some of these companies to at least try to have forms of promoting uh, the more credible things that have been selected, especially for educational audiences. Right, thank you. And then one more question is, um, you made a point about modern citizenship and how actually it, it attacks our credibility by flooding us with all types of information. But in the end, we are like super tired of trying to, to get to the truth. Uh, so in the world of the three minute soundbite, what do you think that how can we develop persistence in young people, but also in ourselves uh, to keep looking for the credible facts? Well, that is very good uh, as a question because it's very difficult. Like one just wants to give up and say, I don't know. But that's the point of that kind of censorship is to make us give up and just kind of resign to confusion and uncertainty. And that is not good for progress. So I feel like there's a couple of things. One, uh, resignation to the confusion and uncertainty is not good for us, is not good for our society. It's also very unsatisfactory because we want to be able to make decisions that make sense for us, that make sense for our families, that students can learn and uh, flourish. So it's also against human flourishing. So my... Um, my sort of meager solution to that is to keep in mind how much more useful it is not to surrender to it and how much more both personally satisfactory and um, gratifying it is to be able to learn from the amazing wealth of information that is out there as uh, I try to sort of highlight uh, rather than surrendering to the to this maze that has been deliberately set up. Uh, but the ideal solution, of course, is not to appeal to personal grit because there's a limit to that, but to make it easier for people to persevere by making sure they have healthier choices. To me, this is a little bit like if you feed people terrible food, uh, like if you serve them terrible food, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then you get mad at them for not having willpower, that's not a great solution. You want to have the nice, tasty, healthy options on the menu as well, so that people have those choices to make rather than having to fight through all the junk food that just dominates the menu. Yeah, indeed, we need to just like resist from entering the rabbit hole, I guess. <laughs> Well, many thanks, uh, many thanks, Zeynep. Uh, it was uh, truly inspiring for one more time. Actually, I, I really, pleasure. we were all of us like uh, speechless. Thank you very much for this. And we hope that you're going to stay with us in the conference during the next days. So all the best from Europe. 
As a fellow educator, I'm honored to be able to address this, um, you know, my other fellow educators uh, across the pond. Good, great. Thank you very much one more time. Thank you. Um, so now we are closing, we're going towards the end. Um, before we move on to the prize ceremony and Dia Ridini, um, a few things. Uh, so every day, the registered users of, of this conference, so the registered participants of this conference, will be receiving a personalized email with the information about the conference. Now, in this email, we have the links to the workshops, we have the links to the plenary rooms, and the information about the, the networking activity. For the next few days, these emails are going to be your Bible. Um, so please keep your keep these emails uh, and try to save them and read them. Uh, most importantly, and also do not forget to check your spam folder as well. You can also follow and comment on the conference using the hashtag #etwconf21. Thank you for being with us until now. It was an honor to be your host tonight and for the first part of this event. To summarize this plenary, I would like to paraphrase also uh, Frederick Douglass and conclude with, do not forget, media literacy is one of the paths, it is the path to move from the slavery of fear to freedom. So thank you for watching us. Please be back in about 15 minutes and for the eat winning European Award Ceremony. Bye from me.
evening to all from Brussels. I'm Irini and I'm going to be the host of the prize ceremony 2021. I'm sure that we have with us teachers connected from all our retweeting countries and are here to celebrate with us the winners, the winners of the e-twinning prizes 2021. Another year that the conference and the prize ceremony uh, are taking place online. Me in Brussels and you all around Europe and beyond. Many things have changed over the last year. We all developed new competencies, had to adjust in a really new reality. And uh, we, you worked from school, you also had to work uh, online with your students, your, your students, you have to, ad to adjust and change many things over the year. But despite the new challenges, you organized projects and here we are to celebrate the winning ones. So, I need your help tonight. Use the chat in YouTube that I know that you already do it and you did it during the plenary session. And uh, also the hashtag ETWConf21 in Twitter and share your thoughts and send your congratulations to the winners. After all, we're an online community and we know really well how to support each other. The prize ceremony this year is part of the annual conference on media literacy and disinformation that started a bit earlier with a plenary session and continues over the next two days for the registered participants. Tonight, we will see the prize winners of 2021 and we will award two kinds of prizes, the age category prizes and the special ones. We will connect with many countries around Europe and beyond to meet the protagonist teachers. They deserve a big applause, a big applause for all their work and motivation, especially during this quite difficult last year. Tonight, we award individual teachers, but this recognition gives the opportunity to all the community to benefit and uh, get new ideas, be inspired for all your projects and activities you organize in eTwinning. We will start with the age category prizes funded by the European Commission. We received 870 applications this year. These projects were evaluated by three juries, the National Support Organization one, the European jury, and finally, the Grand Jury composed of representatives from the European Commission and pedagogical experts. The evaluation focused on five main criteria, pedagogical innovation, curriculum integration, collaboration between the partner schools, use of technology, results, impact, and documentation. Tonight, although we already know their names, we will meet the protagonists, we will meet the winners, learn some more information about their projects, and of course, celebrate. So, without further delay, let's officially open the prize ceremony 2021. We will start with the runner-ups of the project STEAM Tacted in the age category up to six years old. But before we meet the winners, I think we need to know a little bit about the project. So let's watch a video. Este projeto, muito focado no, no que é o STEAM, na abordagem STEAM, organizou, portanto, nós organizamos um conjunto de atividades mensais, portanto, cada uma de nós escolheu um tema e dentro desse tema, cada uma organizou e planeou uma atividade relacionada com as ciências, tecnologia, engenharia, artes ou matemática. Eu chamo Miguel, tenho 6 anos. Eu me chamo Yara e tenho 6 anos também. Gostamos muito de fazer uh, tipo as pulseiras do código, no código binário, uh, de programar os robôs. Eu gostei muito de fazer as, 
as pulseiras do, Kobe, do código binário e também gostei muito de fazer a experiência do futuro do, do ao mundo futuro. During the pandemic, everyone was, of course, scared. No books have ever taught us how to teach online uh, during a pandemic. We had experiences online, luckily, through its winning platform. So we were lucky that our students were uh, um, engaged in online learning because of its winning. E foi interessante porque nós conseguimos fazer efetivamente muitas atividades. Os pais participaram mais porque se envolveram também eles nas atividades. The parents were coming and commenting like how much their children actually know and they were very surprised. So COVID in a way helped the parents to see the perspective on how the benefits of it winning and also how from a young age they can progress into digital uh, digital citizens but also make something work from the computer to something concrete from a young age. What was the favorite thing in kindergarten doing this project? Mais de fazer as poses em código binário. Eu gostei mais de fazer um, os jogos de robô e as pulseiras em código binário. Eles adoram de, de, trabalhar em, em projeto, uh, uh, adoram colaborar com os colegas, entendem que do outro lado uh, da, da, da, da escola há meninos que da idade deles, do tamanho deles, que fazem as mesmas coisas que eles fazem. Um, em termos de, de, de colaboração, tem sido uma experiência muito interessante. I think ultimately the students benefit a lot from its winning because its winning provides a holistic platform for students to not only work in a very safe environment, but it gives students opportunities to learn about things that will later on help them in their educational journey and also to their life. They work together as stakeholders. It is not just the student themselves. They learn how to collaborate well together, not only where it comes to digital competences, but also holistically when it comes to emotions, socially. You learn that at least the classroom, it is not just the four walls you have inside. It is more than that. And now we are lucky that with the technology we have and with a platform like it winning, we can learn from others, from other schools, that although we are afar, we are all the same and we are not so different from each other. We have with us the teachers from Malta, Portugal and Turkey and Dr. Markus Rester from the European Commission Directorate General for Education, Youth, Sport and Culture. Uh, Dr. Rester, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, congratulations. You're the runner-up in the age category 0 to 6. And uh, I must say, STEAMtastic is oh, a wonderful project. Me, being scientist, I want to be a young scientist again. Um, when I go through your flip book, your activity book, there were so many, so many occurrences where I said, please let me participate. I want to, I want to be part of that because it was so much fun, obviously, like uh, building ships, ships and uh, sinking them. How many times have I done that? Or growing crystals. This is really something I could deeply relate to. And yes, you, you answer a question that is sometimes strikes me. Uh, what does the A in STEAM mean? STEM is clear, but when you look at the binary bracelet, bracelets you did, then suddenly the A part makes total sense uh, to me. Um, again, congratulations, super project. Um, I mentioned already a few things. You did, you did a lot of uh, STEM experiments with your young students, and then uh, lockdown uh, came, schools were closed. How did you continue to do STEM projects uh, while school closures? Well, basically, from the beginning, the project started in October and we gave the students enough tools, enough um, democratic approach for them to try these things at home. So when we went locked down, the students have already gained these competences, enough competences to try things independently. Therefore, the lockdown was simply um, 
something that we used to do at school, but now we changed location, we changed it home, and it was actually a wonderful opportunity because the parents could actually see what we see in class. So uh, you get parents telling you that they didn't know that students could actually be so scientific and they could think uh, out loud. And for us, that meant quite a lot. So although the lockdown happened, um, preparing for them before the lockdown, it was uh, easier for us as educators to uh, be flexible and make it work. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you and congratulations once again. And now let's go to the winning project of the age category up to six years old for the project Key Tree Hangers. One, two, three. Hug the trees with me. Hmm. Would you like to learn a little bit more about all these trees? How the young students were hugging them? What exactly they were doing? Let's watch a video. Αρχικά γνωρίσαμε τον Άδωνη, το γυρεότερο δέντρο της Ευρώπης, το οποίο βρίσκεται στην Ελλάδα. Ο Άδωνη ήταν η μασκότ του έργου. Αυτό έστελνε τι αποστολέ και τα παιδιά τι εκτελούσαν. Φύτεψαμε δεντράκια, μετρήσαμε τον κορμό των δέντρων, υιοθετήσαμε και αγκαλιάσαμε κάποιο πολύ πολύ ε, γέρικο δέντρο τη περιοχή μα και βρήκαμε την ιστορία του. Δημιουργήσαμε βιντεάκια με αυτέ τι ιστορίε και ψηφίσαμε το αγαπημένο μα. Ti sa pri práci s rôznymi projektmi učia spolupracovať, učia sa vyjadrovať svoje myšlienky, získajú nové skúsenosti, zručnosti. Zapojili sme aj rodičov, čo vnímam ako pozitívu. Zasielali na fotografie, videonahrávky, ktoré sme zdieľali na spoločnej virtuálnej nástenke na Padlete aj na Facebooku. Deti motivovali svojich rodičov pri zapojení sa do rôznych aktivít, napríklad pri tvorbe spoločného plagátu Kudňu Zeme, ktorej sme dali názov Deti čistia planétu. Mne sa páčilo, keď sme objímali strom. Mne sa páčilo, keď sklesli sme na strom. A mne sa páčilo, že sme počítali strom. Κύριο στόχο του έργου ήταν να αυξηθεί η περιβαλλοντική συνείδηση των μαθητών με τη χρήση των ε, τεχνολογικών εργαλείων. Τα παιδιά φύτεψαν δέντρα, έμαθαν για τι ανάγκε και τη σπουδαιότητά του στο φυσικό περιβάλλον, του έδωσαν φωνή, αγωνίστηκαν και για την προστασία του, ηχογράφησαν μηνύματα και όλα αυτά αξιοποιώντα το έπακρο, τα συνεργατικά εργαλεία και τη ρομποτική. Έμαθαν να είναι ενεργοί πολίτε και να αγωνίζονται για τα ιδανικά του. Sa s projektom deti veľmi bavila, naučili sa správať zodpovedne a s rešpektom k prírode, vďaka rôznym aktivitám sa dozvedeli množstvo informácií o stromoch, dokonca sa stali aj ich hlasmi. Όταν σχεδιάζουμε δράση για μικρά παιδιά, θα πρέπει πάντα να έχουμε στο μυαλό μας τον τρόπο με τον οποίο μαθαίνουν τα μικρά παιδιά. Τα παιδιά μαθαίνουν μέσα από την επαφή τους με τον κόσμο και μέσα από το παιχνίδι. Οι δράσει μα λοιπόν θα πρέπει να είναι κατάλληλε για αυτή την ηλικία, να είναι βιωματικέ και παιχνιώδει. Να πηγάζουν από τα ενδιαφέροντα των παιδιών και να έχουν νόημα για αυτά. Έτσι μόνο θα μπορέσουμε να ενισχύσουμε τι ήπιε και ψηφιακέ του δεξιότητε, τι δεξιότητε του 21ου αιώνα, όπω είναι η συνεργασία, η επικοινωνία, η δημιουργικότητα, η επίλυση προβλήματο, και θα κερδίσουμε το αμέριστο ενδιαφέρον του και την ενεργό συμμετοχή του. Και με το e-twinning, αυτό είναι παιχνιδάκι. Ποια ήταν η αγαπημένη σου δραστηριότητα? Ήταν όταν κρεμάσαμε τα μπέλες στα δέντρα και όταν φτιάξαμε δέντρα με μερέντα. Ήταν όταν παίξαμε με το μπιμποτ και έπρεπε το μπιμποτ να πάει στο δέντρο για να το σώσει. Σαμοζρήμε ακογέκι μάλι μνωστό τάζο και βέγει αστρομυρό σπράβα ακο σπιά ako dýchajú, čo pijú, aký by bol život bez stromov, keby som bol stromom, akým by som chcel byť. 
Naučili sa spolupracovať v skupinách, spolupracovať s kamarátmi z partnerských škôl. Οι μαθητέ, μέσα από τα έργα που υλοποιούμε κάθε χρονιά, ταξιδεύουν στη γνώση παρέα με μαθητέ από όλο τον κόσμο. Μαθαίνουν ότι και άλλα παιδιά έχουν τι ίδιε ανησυχίε με αυτά. Μοιράζονται ιδέε και γνώσει και γίνονται μια ομάδα για την επίτευξη κοινών στόχων. Όλοι μαζί έχουν πιο δυνατή φωνή και μπορούν να υλοποιήσουν ό,τι ονειρευτούν. Επίση, μαθαίνουν ότι αυτά που μα χωρίζουν είναι πολύ λιγότερα από αυτά που μα ενώνουν. So we have with us... The teachers, the winning teachers from Bulgaria, Greece, and Slovakia. Welcome to all and congratulations for your prize. And uh, Dr. Rester, I think you want to say something to our winners here? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Congratulations. You are the winner of the age category 0 to 6. I mean, this is the ultimate honor teachers and students can get for any tuning project. So you reached re really top top class of, of uh, an inspiring uh, e-twinning project. I mean, your project goal was to raise environmental consciousness, but you connected to local environment, you connected to natural heritage, you connected to cultural heritage, and you did that with IT tools in many cases. So this is really, really, you are, ah, you even participated in the European Code Week. I mean, Combining all the things, it's really an such inspiring uh, cross-curricular approach that you you you've undertaken with your project. So once more, congratulations to this uh, prize being the winner. Um, my, I would like to to to talk with you about a bit that um, you collab collaborated a lot with uh, with parents. How did you achieve that, and uh, what was the what was the feedback of the parents? Uh, well, uh, we send uh, some challenges to the to the houses of the children of the students, and uh, so parents had to work with uh, their children at home, and then uh, uh, bring back to school uh, some uh, uh, crafts uh, from uh, uh, some materials they use uh, from materials they use, and uh, they also uh, during COVID. Uh, they planted some uh, trees in their uh, houses and sent us uh, some photos. Uh, they all, uh, the parents are always uh, beside us. Uh, they are uh, partners of our project too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Super. Thank you. Congratulations once more. Thanks a lot. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. And now we will go to the next age category with students 7 to 11 years old and we will start with a runner-ups project in your shoes. Let's watch a video to learn a little bit more about the project. The project In Your Shoes is the runner-up 2021 in the category 7 to 11 years old among 314 total applications for the same age category. The project was selected and evaluated and became part of the final group of candidates with other 14 projects where it finally achieved this important recognition. The founders of the project are Yolanda Moya, Escola Labenaula, Spain, and Jaroslava Kazarian, Veliko Mikhailivka, Secondary School, Ukraine. The project focused on special needs and disabilities as an important way of developing social and civic competencies of pupils, like the ability to understand social reality and be able to maintain an ethical, constructive, supportive and empathic attitude. The methodology used in the project focused on exploring the close context of the students, families, friends, associations or entities in the area. Each of the physical, mental or social disabilities had been worked through different activities such as interviews with family members or by contacting different associations which were invited to explain their experience in the classroom. Together with information collected in the interviews, several different experimentation activities like role play, simulations, preparation of adapted materials, stimulation of empathy or creative thinking were designed and implemented. 
The focus on English as a foreign language was very important all along the project. The students always worked in small groups, both at the classroom level, national groups, or in international groups. Pupils were very active in the project together with parents and relevant professional organizations and every aspect of the cooperation worked. The result is a great work of reflection and respect towards the others. So, as you saw, this was a project between Greece, Spain and Slovenia. And we have with us uh, Dimitra from Greece and also me, Sophie Bernard, uh, from the European Education and Culture Executive Agency. Uh, Dimitra, congratulations from, for your prize. Ms. Bernard, the floor is yours. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Well, okay. first, so I, would I like, see of course, only six videos and you are and nine, actually a little bit more than nine. Us, but also all the so that made it happen, I that hope it, that everybody is listening project. to me and that can we open really the cameras. Appreciated how much it would be a shame that we wouldn't see you. And inclusion, thanks to your project. For yes. various categories of people, please you open your cameras. With people with disabilities, with refugees, you really tried to, to make it as, yes, a very inclusive project and also obviously inclusion was also in the way you collaborated with each other thank we have you seen that how much <laughs> collaboration sorry, was sorry for interrupting you but uh, we have a problem with uh, the sound so just give us a second you know we are live and you know live sometimes we have some hiccups and things don't work the way they should work so just give us one uh, minute and uh, my technical team here are working on it and we are going to fix it very soon. Um, so yes, uh, we are talking about a very interesting project. And uh, I think that they, all the projects, all the projects actually that now you can see a video only, I would really advise you to go to the Twin Space. So we have uh, posted in uh, the portal of eTwinning, but also in the page, and you can go and see some more information. So the problem has been fixed. Ms. Bernat, uh, you can, uh, I think it's better to start over again. Thank you very much. Okay, well, so I was congratulating Dimitra and all the, uh, the teachers that have been very active in this project, in this very inspiring project. And um, this project is focused on inclusion and diversity and we really appreciated that, but also the strong collaboration that you had between yourselves thanks to the use of the twin spaces in particular this platform really enabled you to exchange results of the activities between the different schools and you managed to address such a wide variety of activity to enhance several skills from your students you really worked with a lot of different um, colleagues in different fields so really congratulations for that for all the work you have done and that led to this wonderful project in your shoes. And now I would like to ask you a question, Dimitra. In your project, students of primary school worked and reflected on physical and mental disabilities. How easy or how difficult was it to approach such a topic, to approach disability with quite young children? Okay, first of all, thank you very much. Um, even if it sounds uh, strange, it wasn't too difficult because uh, through the activities, um, practical activities, tangible activities, we try to uh, uh, we we try to think and create in order to to put uh, to get students into these um, into how these people with special uh, um, uh, impairments feel, and they responded really well. Um, uh, they get really touched by um, uh, all these difficulties, and uh, most uh, most of all, they were really touched by the activities uh, regarding uh, the people with um, uh, vi visually impaired people, and and and they really. I think that we try to. Uh, we managed to make them uh, get into their shoes and um, um, develop the sense, uh, the feeling of empathy, which we think uh, is really important for um, uh, 
uh, a very important quality for the students to develop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both very much. And now I, let's go to the winning project of the age category 7 to 11. Animal friends in an animal friendly world. But before we see the protagonist, let's watch a video. Își propune aprofundarea cunoștințelor despre caracterele fizice, sănătatea, hrănirea, obiceiurile celor mai comune animale care trăiesc pe pământ. Împărțiți în grupuri, elevii au realizat o carte colaborativă în care, pe lângă aceste informații, au adăugat și detalii despre drepturile și felul în care trăiesc animalele din propria țară. All the information was collected into an e-book. As a final common product. We shot also a documentary and uh, was uploaded onto the project channel. Pentru elevii mei, uh, Etuing a fost o experiență minunată din care au avut multe de învățat. Ei și-au perfecționat abilitățile de limba engleză, au învățat noi instrumente web 2.0, au colaborat cu elevii din alte școli, lucrând în echipe mixte. Din acest proiect am învățat să colaborez cu toți colegii de clasă și cu elevii din țările parteneri. Am învățat cum să cooperez cu persoanele de lângă mine, colegii cu care am lucrat la proiect, profesori și am descoperit multe lucruri noi și mi-am dezvoltat foarte multe abilități. Cred că această experiență este necesară în viața fiecărui copil, deoarece contribuie la dezvoltarea unor abilități utile în viața de zi cu zi. Eğitiminin sayesinde öğrencilerimiz Avrupa kültürünün çeşitliliğini ve zenginliğini gözlemlediler ve o büyük ailenin bir parçası oldular. Eğitiminin gibi markaplı şeyleri sayacak olursam öncelikle başka ülkelerle yaşlıklarımla konuşma şansı buldum. Bu benim hep istediğim bir şeydi ve buna eğitiminin sayesinde başardım. Ayrıca yaptığım araştırmalar sayesinde hayvanları daha iyi tanıdım ve onlar için faydalı neler yapabileceğimi öğrendim. Bunlar benim asla unutmayacağım şeyler. Benim favorim veteriner dizisiydi. Burada veterinerler istediğimiz soruları sorma şansımız oldu. Onlara zorlandıkları yerleri ve onların başından geçen ilginç olayları sorduk. Ve oraya bir tane tedavi edilmesi için sincapın getirilmesi beni gerçekten şaşırtmıştı. Ve bu sayede de yeni bir meslek grubu tanış olduk. The project helped in COVID related teaching challenges because we had a common goal to reach. Even if we were on this as learning. În această perioadă am comunicat mai mult cu elevii mei, atât pe grupul de Facebook al clasei, cât și pe Zoom, continuând activitățile din proiect și încercând să facem față noilor provocări. Öğrencilerin proje boyunca Twin Space'i aktif olarak kullandılar. Yapılan paylaşımlara beğeni ve yorumlar yaptılar ve buradan birbirlerini motive ettiler. Ben öğrencilerimle iletişimi oluşturduğumuz WhatsApp grubu üzerinden sağladım. Etkinliklerimizi ve görev dağılımlarımızı burada organize ettik. Öğrencilerin salgın sürecinde de çalışmalarına büyük bir istekle devam ettiler. Nasıl uçakta tatip, pozele, desenele, filmuletsele, işit atak gibi desene bir karar yapmak için am să amintesc mereu de cum am cunoscut mulți oameni, am învățat să interacționăm unii cu alții și am învățat foarte multe lucruri despre culturi diferite. Cosa vă ați imparat cu acest proiect? Eu am imparat pericolare engleză. Eu am imparat că toți noi să avem fare pericolare de speciale, că gli animali vengono trattati con amore e con respect. Eu am imparat că gli animali în engleză. So, welcome with us, the teachers from Croatia, Greece, Italy, Romania, Turkey and Ukraine. Congratulations for your awards. 
And Miss Bernard, I think she would like to tell you something as well. Miss Bernard. Yes, hello. Well, I really would like to congratulate you all. I'm very happy that we are all connected today to celebrate your project, Animal Friends in an Animal Friendly World. So congratulations, my friends, for, uh, for this very inspiring project. It's a very topical project because we are now at a time where we feel it's very crucial to rethink our relationship to nature and to the living world. We were speaking the previous project about empathy, but you also with your project, we want you went really beyond the development of the skills that we usually teach to young people and you really focused on this empathy and on cultivating empathy, not only towards human beings, but as, as well towards all living things. So we really appreciated your approach. We really loved as well the multidimensionary dimension, uh, multidisciplinary dimension, sorry, that, that you have uh, put in your project. You were teachers from different countries, but as well from different fields, and all of you collaborated together to make this extremely interesting and inspiring project. Also, you dealt very adequately with e-safety, with the N-etiquette, uh, you involve the parents, you, in, you teach about data protection. So all that is extremely important now, and that's something that we would like to develop so much in, in all school of Europe. So you are winners, you are front runners, you are the one who are leading the way. And what is really great as well is that you compiled all your uh, activities and uh, great examples into a neat winning kit. So you really contributed to develop that field even more. And the uh, sustainability of our project is something that we are really keen to promote. And you are one of the best examples of that. So congratulations again. Thanks to all of you for your commitment and for the, the great project that you managed to, to put uh, together. So many thanks to all of you to have done that together. And now I would like to ask a question to, to one of you. So you created this series of documentaries that are very useful material for everyone who would like to, to know more about that field. So, for, and uh, I'd like to know how did the students work on these documentaries, but what was their feedback when doing that? How much did they appreciate doing that? Thank you so much for your question and thank you for your kind words on uh, our project, about our project. Uh, our students uh, were, uh, uh, were very conscious of uh, the importance of uh, uh, love for animals fr from the very beginning of the project. And in fact, uh, they started um, this, designing this documentary uh, and uh, they prepared the posters, uh, videos, uh, uh, sentences, texts uh, to make up this uh, documentary. And uh, uh, we wanted to um, create a, a TV channel. This TV channel, Animal World, uh, was created by our students who worked in teams and they um, made uh, also do, during the pandemic uh, many work, uh, many works uh, about uh, uh, taking care of animals. Um, so our motto was an, um, do a good deed to an animal in need. And uh, all students were concentrated on this task. Uh, they were very active. Their feedback were, was very good because uh, they were always um, focused on doing uh, good actions. I think the most uh, uh, appreciable um, uh, result of this project was uh, their active uh, attitude to animals at the end of the project. And I can say just a very, uh, um, quote, a very uh, nice episode because one of my students uh, at the end of the project, uh, after the pandemic, uh, uh, was uh, and the restrictions were a bit uh, less uh, strict. Um, this student organized a, a stand to uh, send some uh, old things uh, uh, she had uh, in her house 
for uh, to gather money for a kennel nearby. So I think uh, this is just one of um, an example of what uh, students uh, did uh, throughout the project. But uh, many students do did uh, the same. Many students of our uh, schools, and uh, I think uh, that was uh, the most. Um, uh, the, the most uh, beautiful result of this uh, project. It is make students aware of what uh, surround them and uh, uh, what they can do for animals and for all uh, living beings, and as you said before. Thank you. Thank you very much all and congratulations once again. So, I think now it's time to go to our next age category, students 12 to 15 years old, and we will start with the runner-ups project, Future Journalists. So, let's watch a short video to learn a little bit more about the project. Sizin de bildiğiniz gibi Future Journalist uluslararası bir itiminlik projesi. Türkiye, Romanya, Ukrayna, Azerbaycan, Arnavutluk, Hırvatistan ve İtalya proje ortaklığı ile gerçekleştirilmiş yenilikçi bir öğrenme projesi. Proiectul are ca scop folosirea surselor online precum mass media pentru a înțelege ce presupune activitatea unui jurnalist și a unui moderator de emisiuni, cum ar putea deveni elevi în viitor. Projenin yaş grubu 10 ile 20 yaş, 20 yaş arasıydı. Dili İngilizceydi. Projede 18 öğretmen, 210 öğrenci ile gerçekleştirildi. Pentru elevi mei, Etuing a însemnat un nou fel de învățare, interactivă, colaborarea cu elevi din alte școli, exersarea limbilor străine, dezvoltarea abilităților TIC și a lucrului în echipă. În acest proiect am avut ocazia de a deveni jurnalist pentru o zi și de a vedea ce implică această meserie. Geleceğin gazetecileri projesinde her ay çok önemli konular işledik. İklim değişikliği, cinsiyet eşitliği, teknoloji gibi. Din acest proiect am învățat să colaborez cu toți colegii de clasă și cu elevii din țările parteneri. Etkinlik sayesinde sınıfta birçok etkinlik yapıyoruz. Grup çalışmalarını çok seviyorum. Harika ve peki araçları öğrendik. Posterler, logolar, board art çalışmaları, yarışmalar harika. Activitățile desfășurate prin intermediul Twin Space le-au oferit elevilor posibilitatea de a se implica activ în toate etapele proiectului, de a colabora cu partenerii din proiect, de a și exersa cunoștințele de IT și de limbă engleză, de a înțelege beneficiile și amenințările presei asupra democrației, de a-și consolida abilitățile de gândire critică prin folosirea noilor tehnologii și metode de comunicare, de cunoaștere și de autocunoaștere. Cinsiyet eşitliği konusundan başlamak istiyorum. Ülkemde daha çok ateerkil bir görenek var. Her kesimde olmasa da bir kesim böyle ne yazık ki. Erkek çocuk ve erkek daha önemsenebiliyor. Ben Türkiye'de büyük şehirde yaşıyorum. Burası modern bir yer diyebilirim. Öğrencilerim de erkek kadın ayrımı yapmıyorlar. Ancak bu konuyu ele aldığımızda olumsuz düşüncelerin de farkında oldular ve üzüldüler. Eminim gelecekte cinsiyet eşitliğinin yılmaz savunucuları olacaklar. Evet onlar da bizim gibiler. Çok da uzak değillermiş dediler. Farklı ülke, farklı dil, okul, sınıf olsak da birçok sorunumuz ortak. İklim değişikliği, cinsiyet eşitliği gibi. Hatta aynı dijital araçları kullanıyoruz. Cep telefonlarımız bile aynı. Kıyafetlerimiz, dış görüşümüz aynı. Böyle düşünmek onları birbirine yaklaştırdı. Ve varsa bir ön yargıları bence artık yok. Hepsi Twinning'in bize sundukları sayesinde. So, we have with us the teachers, but also students from the project from Azerbaijan, Romania, Turkey and Ukraine. And we have also Ariste, Mrs. Aristea Politi from the European Commission Directorate General for Education, Youth, Sport and Culture. Congratulations for your award. Congratulations all. Miss Politi, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Irene. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really honored and happy to be here today to congratulate the runner-up project for the category of uh, 20 to 15 years old, future journalists. So your project links perfectly with the each winning annual theme of media literacy and reminds us all how important it is that young people, actually the journalists of tomorrow, are able to use carefully and correctly the numerous online sources and media to gather accurate information and fight discrimination and fake news. I'm quoting the lyrics of your winning song. Information is power. News should be announced to everyone. Journalists should seek the truth. Journalism is an inspiration for cultures. For culture. Congratulations, future journalists. One thing that really astonished me in your project is that uh, the participation and collaboration of students between 10 to 20 years old. How was this collaboration possible? How did these uh, students, learners, manage to work together? What were the positive outcomes and maybe some challenges? Thank you and congratulations again. Thank you, uh, dear friends. We are honored to. Um, be awarded uh, this uh, huge achievement for us. Um, the problem was that half of the project was uh, during before the pandemic and uh, afterwards uh, the pandemic outbreak. Uh, so we uh, adjusted uh, activities according to students' age. Uh, they worked in mixed uh, international groups basically two groups of uh, journalists and uh, anchor persons and uh, because the school was uh, online uh, we also continued uh, our school online and our students were already used to uh, developing activities online so it it was not very difficult to continue and moreover we uh, kept them busy in the meaning that uh, uh, it uh, enhanced their resilience uh, having to do uh, the tasks all the time they uh, got empowered and uh, become became uh, extremely resilient which uh, could be seen in uh, this achievement. Thank you. Uh, and I think we also have a student with us. Huh? So I would really like to hear the we student perspective. <laughs> so, um, what was the fit? I mean, we saw the teachers, but it's always in really interesting to hear what a student has to say. How do you consider your participation in this project? What was Let's say the thing that you will remember, the thing that you will take back, you will keep for yourself for this project of what you did. Uh, is that... Hi, Irva. Yes. Uh, my Hello. name is Vishaya and I'm a student. I'm 16 years old and I have been taking a evening about one year. And Atunic has helped me to communicate with other humans and speak English with my friends. Uh, May I ask you, Busta, do you have your camera? Would you like to turn on your camera so we can see you? Yes, I can. Wait a minute. That will be great. I mean, it's not, a, you know, always easy at that time of day to have students with us. So you are our best guest uh, here. That's great. That will be great. Thank you. So, continue. And, Tell me. Uh, before, before project, uh, I have not met people around me who speak English and I can speak, but in the project, and I got humans who speak English and I improve my English. Great. So, what you will actually take with you is that it was an opportunity to speak English in a better way, you know, as you had to communicate with your partners from the other countries, right? Yes, uh, the communicate is well because we know English and they know English and we communicate. Great. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. And now 
Are you ready? Would you like to see the winners of the age category 12 to 15? If yes, let's go to watch the video for the project Myth Arts, Myths in Art and Literature. Mizart intentamos acercarnos al mundo de la mitología y a través de la mitología estudiar eh, su influencia y repercusión en la literatura y en la, y en la arte plástica, en la pintura, en la escultura eh, a lo largo de toda la historia. Lo que estaba bien también en este proyecto internacional era ver que des Italiens, des Espagnols et des Français n'avaient pas forcément la même manière de voir les choses ni d'apprendre le latin, mais le fait de partir de la, des mythes, c'était quelque chose de commun qui a permis de rassembler tout le monde et de permettre à chacun de se comprendre et de rebondir sur quelque chose qu'ils connaissaient et qui était familier pour eux. Donc c'était une bonne manière d'apprendre à, à connaître l'autre. We were divided in multinational groups that were dedicated to different gods of mythology. So I was with other students in Apollo's group. So it was pretty fun. I enjoyed a lot participating in the international caput about mythology. And I also turned in Hercules. Uh, it was amazing and unforgettable. The results of the project, apart from del aumento de conocimiento en nuestro alumnado eh, se puede resumir en tres productos tangibles que son el libro electrónico, los podcasts grabados sobre los distintos mitos y el challenge que es quizás el resultado final del que nos sentimos más orgullosas. I have learned that uh, we have got many things in common with European countries and a common heritage that needs to be preserved. Alors, uh, e-twinning is a good way to do work together with the students, but also to do them travel. Because even if they remain in the midst of their class, the fact that they have connections with l'Italie ou l'Espagne leur a permis d'avoir un sentiment d'ouverture et de voyage un petit peu dans ces différents pays. Donc ça c'est important. Euh, ils se sont aussi rendus compte que euh, la base de la culture européenne était commune, euh, qu'il y avait les, les mythes antiques, qu'ils pouvaient aussi communiquer ensemble grâce à l'anglais et grâce à des outils numériques qui étaient aussi communs dans les différents pays. Donc ça, ça leur a permis de se sentir appartenir à une communauté un peu plus grande que celle du, de leur classe ou du collège. I have learned to work in group, uh, to study a classical subject in a different way. I sincerely learned a lot thanks to a training, both for my working experience, such as new organization abilities or new technological and creative skills. But I also learned a lot for my life, like how to build the relationships with students and with students from other countries, how to learn about new cultures, new school systems. Para mi alumnado, participar en, pro, en proyecto e twinning tiene el valor añadido de que se siente en parte de una sociedad más amplia que va más allá de nuestra frontera. I will bring with me long life uh, friendships, but of course I will bring with me the ability to adapt to new environments and uh, to team play. To work in class in a traditional way from the, the original, to be creative. And to listen to other's opinion. Uh, I have a lot of very good friends, memories, a lot of things. Welcome with us, the teachers from France, Italy and Spain. 
Congratulations for your award. And Ms. Aristeapolidi, I think would like to say some words to you. Thank you very much again, Irene. It's a great honor to be here today to award the eight winning European prize for the eight category 12 to 15 years old. My heart is full of joy and pride for this unique project. Recently, my 13 years old uh, daughter, while reflecting on which subjects to choose in the coming years, she asked me, how ancient Greek and arts will be useful and important in my life? Oops, I could not find a better answer than introducing her to your amazing project. So you saved my life, really. I'm astonished to see how rich in content and creativity this project is and how many dimensions it has embraced. Congratulations again. You competed among 299 projects and you are the winner. But let me ask you, how did you manage to raise awareness of classical world and arouse interest in the classical world while developing the awareness of belonging to Europe? First of all, thank you very much for uh, this uh, uh, opportunity to share our pro project. We are very proud of being here. To answer your question, I can say that we follow some steps. First of all, we started from brainstorming and ask our students what they, do they know and what were their favorite gods and goddesses. After that, we organize international teams, 10 international teams according to their choice, and they did some research to have information they created the day CVs. Uh, so we transformed something that was ancient in something modern uh, in order to involve them and to motivate them. Collaboration was the basis of our project and uh, the fact that they need to link uh, the myths uh, to the work of art was very important because they understand that classical the themes is at the base of our European common heritage. Thank you. Thank you Thank all you. very much and congratulations once again. And we go now to our last age category to the older students, 16 to 19 years old. And we will start with the runner-ups and a project about the radio. So listen to my radio, breaking news. What all this is about? Let's watch the video. Bidez, gure ikasleek irratiaren magia sentitu dute eta hizkuntza eta teknologia erabiltzen ikasi dute irrati hiztun profesionalak balira bezala. Bigai izan dira proiektuaren ardatza. Alde batetik nerabeen irakurketa oiturak eta zaletasunak. Bestetik garapen jasangarrirako helburuak. È un progetto incentrato sulla forza comunicativa della voce che arriva al pubblico attraverso la radio e soprattutto attraverso il podcast. Quindi i ragazzi si sono gradualmente avvicinati a questa forma di comunicazione, hanno ehm, studiato come produrli, quindi dal punto di vista tecnico e tecnologico, hanno cercato di capire quali fossero le caratteristiche di un podcast di eh, qualità e poi si sono cimentati nella loro realizzazione, prima in gruppi nazionali e poi con i partner stranieri. By means of this project we learn to use the language and the technology as if we were professional radio speakers. We also learned about sustainable development goals and we became aware of the 2030 agenda. Hori izan da ikasketa nagusia, baina ez da bakarra izan. Berriak bilatu, laburtu, forma eman eta irratxa jokutsua emanez, ingelesez zabaldu egin dituzte. Bestalde, etorkizuneko gizartean arrakastaz mugitzeko hain beharrezkoak diren autonomia, Ekimena eta talde lana benetan zer den ulertu dute. I think the most interesting part of the project was collaborating with the young people from uh, different countries 
uh, we learned a lot uh, about technology, uh, the topics of the 2030 agenda, and we discussed about what government are doing uh, in order to achieve them. In my opinion, it was really interesting to know firsthand the policies that the governments of Finland, France, Germany and Turkey carry out according to the 2030 agenda. And after this project, I personally wanted to carry some of these ideas out in my community. Talde internazionaletan lan egitea sormen eta ikaskuntza sustatu ditu. Sormena areagotu egiten da talde lanean aritzean eta kasu honetan podcastetan antzematen da. Ikasleek indarrak batu zituzten eraginkortasuna eta produktibitatea handituz. Jardueraren bukaeran ikasleen autoestimua nabarmen igotzen. I think we improved a lot of different competencies. First of all, uh, we had the opportunity to use English for real purposes. Uh, we learned to use a new application that turned out to be useful during um, distance, distance learning. And we got to know other cultures and other ways of thinking and communicating. Tramite la conoscenza di altre realtà scolastiche europee, di usi e di tradizioni, i ragazzi hanno avuto l'opportunità di venire in contatto con una grande diversità culturale. L'Europa è diventata qualcosa di concreto e eh, il lavoro trasnazionale che hanno fatto a gruppi eh, ha dato loro la possibilità di toccare con mano quanto sia importante ragionare insieme su certe tematiche e trovare una lingua comune per superare le divergenze. Cooperation with students from other countries was the best part of the project. It was great to get in touch with other European girls and boys, getting to know them a bit more and having to reach agreements in order to achieve the final goal. Thanks to AP training, our class opened up to Europe and we have grown up in many ways. So, let's welcome and congratulate our teachers from Finland, Germany, Italy, Spain and Turkey. And we also have with us Ms. Ulrike Storos from the European Commission, Directorate General for Education, Youth, Sport and Culture. Congratulations to all. Uh, Ms. Storos, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. So it's really my great, great honor to congratulate you very, very warmly on being the runner up in the age category 16 to 19. Uh, I think I read um, in the project description actually that it was about making students feel the magic of radio. But actually, when looking at the watching the video and reading also the project description and the outcomes, uh, you made me feel the magic of you really your work with the students. It was it was amazing. Uh, uh, there have been so many activities all along this project about radio. Uh, you visited even a, a radio studio and uh, you introduced your students into the podcast production. And um, what really impressed me also was that you organized it in a way that uh, the students of different schools and nationalities actually managed to debate and to find compromises, you know, something that is not even always that easy here <laughs> in, the, in, uh, in the capital of Europe. So uh, really very warmly my congratulations to, to all of you. Um, your project includes innovation, success, e-safety, uh, multidisciplinary teams, critical thinking, so really a lot of, of, uh, of dimensions covered. And I would actually like to ask you one topic um, about, uh, one question about the topic you chose. So you, you actually um, had your students creating podcasts on the Sustainable Development Goals 2030. So why did you select this particular topic and how did the students actually approach um, these goals? Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank on behalf of all the partners uh, and for the kind introduction. Uh, we worked tra uh, with transnational teams uh, and both national teams as well. Uh, for transnational teams, our topic was sustainable development goals, and uh, we wanted uh, all uh, we put all the goals on the forum, and our students uh, choose the goals by themselves. The control was with them. We just guided them, and uh, they choose uh, whatever goals they wanted, and. Um, some of them uh, chose climate change, maybe um, some of them uh, put their names on the zero hunger and as it goes on. 
And uh, actually, we wanted all our students uh, to raise awareness about global issues. And um, I think it's really important for all the uh, teenage teenagers to be uh, aware of the, um, what's happening around them. And we, I think uh, we achieved this, uh, although the coronavirus pandemic, uh, because uh, the transnational teams working was uh, in the second term, but uh, we were able to motivate them uh, with our great partners uh, all together. Uh, it was a bit difficult, but we managed it. And we, um, in the end, um, the outputs were really spectacular. Thank you. Thank you all and congratulations once again. Thanks. Let's go now to the winning project of the age category 16 to 19 years old and the project Climate Volunteers. But before we see the protagonist, let's watch a video. Proiectul Climate Volunteers este un proiect inovativ și de actualitate. Am dorit prin acest proiect să abordăm multidisciplinar uh, problema globală privind schimbările climatice. Ne-am axat în primul rând pe cauzele schimbării climatice și de asemenea pe efectele acestora asupra populației, a viețuitoarelor, a, a fenomenelor meteorologice, a unei vieți sustenabile pe care ne-o dorim toți. Proje öncesinde öğrencilerin iklim sorunları hakkında duyarlılıkları ve farkındalıkları yetersizdi. Projedeki öğretmen ve öğrencilerin görüşleri yapılan anketler sonucunda iklim değişikliğini anlama, etkileri, mücadelesi ve sürdürülebilirlik açısından olumlu bir davranış oluşturması açısından ailelerinden de geri bildirim alınarak değerlendirildi ve projemizin başarıya ulaştığı e, tespit edildi. Uh, we found we found a lot of new things that we don't find in our books and what I found interesting was the final project. Astfel elevi, înainte probabil că nu au fost atât de conștienți de ce, dar după toate activitățile de proiect din Climate Volunteers, ei au reușit să fie mai conștienți, răspundă singur la întrebările de ce. Elevii au descoperit în timpul acțiunii proiectului și activităților colaborative de proiect că totul se leagă și este într-o uh, interdependență. Ceea ce consumăm, ceea ce cumpărăm, ceea ce aruncăm ca deșeu. Proje multidisciplinar bir yaklaşıma sahipti ve ekip çalışması, girişimci tutum, kültürel anlayış, BT ve İngilizce iletişim becerileri gibi 21. yüzyıl becerilerinin gelişmesine odaklandı. Etivinik projelerinin gelecekteki öğrencilerimin kariyerlerine çok büyük katkıları olacağını inanıyorum. Çünkü Etivinik projeleri sayesinde farklı Avrupa ülkeleriyle güçlü iletişim ve işbirliği içinde yürütülen çalışmalarla yabancı dil ve dijital becerileri arttı. Küresel sorunların çözümüne yönelik çalışmalarda sorumluluk duyguları gelişti. Digital materialler konusunda farkındalıkları arttı. Uh, an e-tuning class is much more attractive and fun, in my opinion. We use many tools and apps which helps us grow. E-tuning sınıfındaki bütün öğrenciler, normal bir sınıfa göre güçlü iletişim, işbirliği ve sorumluluk duygusuna sahiptirler. Takım halinde çalışma bilinci üst düzeydedir. Öğrencilerin yabancı dil becerileri, gelişmiş ve dijital araçların ve internetin bilinçli ve etkin kullanımı konusunda bilinçlidirler. Sadece bizler değil, okulumuzdaki ve çevremizdeki tüm insanlara örnek davranışlar geliştirdik, farkındalıklar oluşturduk. Geliştirici yanı ise proje koordinasyonunda biz öğretmenlerin önemli rol almalarıydı. Küresel iklim değişikliği gibi büyük bir sorunun çözümü konusunda böyle bir projede yer almak beni çok etkiledi. Özellikle bunu dört farklı ülkeden öğretmen ve öğrenci arkadaşlarına bir olup sürekli irtibat halinde olarak gerçekleştirmemiz beni çok etkiledi. Bu proje kendimi özel hissettirdi. Bu projede büyük tecrübe kazandım. Produsele de proiect sunt foarte bune și acest lucru denotă logic că colaborarea din proiect a fost maximă și eficientă. 
atât între profesori cât și între uh, elevii. Kesinlikle etnik projelerinin gelecekte kariyerime çok yardımcı olacağını düşünüyorum. Çünkü etnik projeleri sayesinde farklı Avrupa ülkeleriyle güçlü bir iletişim ve işbirliği içerisine yürütülen çalışmalarla dijital becerilerimin ve yabancı dilimin geliştiğini, küresel sorunların çözümüne yönelik çalışmalarda sorumluluk duygumun geliştiğini ve dijital materyaller konusunda farkındalığımın arttığını düşünüyorum. Welcome with us the teachers from the Republic of Moldova, Romania, Turkey and Ukraine. Congratulations for your awards. And uh, Ms. Torost, I think uh, she would like to tell you something, right? Yes, first of all, congratulations. You made it. You are uh, the winner of the age group uh, 16 to 19. So that is uh, in itself really an achievement. Um, you were courageous, uh, very courageous uh, to, to uh, take global climate change as your topic. It's, it's really the biggest environmental problem of our times. Not at all easy to tackle, of course, very close to the heart of, of us and, and in particular of the students. Uh, so already, already in this dimension, your project uh, is extremely inspirational for, for many other teachers in this community and, and also beyond, of course. Uh, but as we also just saw in the video, you didn't leave it at that. You also addressed the 21st century skills, no? such as responsibility, communicating, uh, digital tools, cultural understanding. So really a lot uh, packed into the project and you excelled in all of these dimensions and in particular, you excelled together. You really made it together, nine schools from four countries. Um, so you see many of you are actually here today and that's really nice to see uh, the room also so full. And uh, we consider this is really a best practice um, of collaborative project work. Congratulations again for everybody who got curious to learn more. You documented your work very well. Uh, you created a logo, a logo, a slogan, an e-magazine, a story, a mind map, songs, videos. Uh, so really, um, yeah, you you you gave your your your students also a lot of of tools to to become these climate volunteers. And this is what my question is actually about. So how do you think that these uh, activities of the project influence the behavior of your students so related to climate change adaptation or climate change? mitigation. The floor is yours. Thank you. I think uh, the these activities uh, uh, were before prepared in all schools regarding climate action because we uh, attended last year another uh, global project and uh, I noticed and I we collaborate after um, this climate volunteers project in another project together in the same team as the second part of this prize uh, called green innovation. So we uh, noticed that our students uh, became more responsible and they had a force to go on regarding waste regarding uh, consuming energy regarding everything it's related with the green deal program for uh, next uh, 30 years until uh, 2050 uh, we have uh, in romania schools uh, school for example a national program called uh, uh, eco provocaria which means that provoke schools to com to go in competition on uh, uh, uh, three, four, five uh, categories regarding waste, regarding economy of uh, the raw material that we use also in uh, industries, also regarding uh, light consuming, regarding uh, fossil fa fossils that we use. So our students for sure uh, became more responsible and aware about 
what is coming next because we are not trying just to to keep the waste for this moment uh, they realize that if you uh, take care now this will have effect after 30 years students yes um they they not they find out the programs uh, in european uh, european programs and also they uh, um, were in contact with global other schools and they realized they are the main uh, uh, characters that will change the world in the future that are able to change the world in the future now and um, uh, because we know the slogan there is no planet b and their uh, environment and planet must be kept healthy and if it's possible to make it more healthy to be sure that after 30 years 50 years the planet will be clean thank For you thank you thank you very much thank you <laughs> thank you all congratulations to all so did uh, you enjoy the first part of our prize ceremony we are not over yet we are still have five special category prizes to award I would like here to thank the members of the European Commission for their presence and before we proceed to the second part I think we all need a little break you know you can grab a coffee or a tea or I mean I'm taking the time maybe even a drink and I will see you in 10 minutes and don't forget also we still have to use we can use the hashtag in Twitter it etwconf21 so you can share all your thoughts or your congratulations still there so a 10 minutes break and we will back here don't go away
are back after a really short break. And we are going to start now with the special prizes and the citizenship prize sponsored by the French and the German National Support Organization. And the prize goes to the project EcoFab Lab. EcoFab Lab is a multidisciplinary project that developed a digital fabrication workshop. The students worked in transnational teams using Arduino, single board microcontrollers and microcontroller kits for building digital devices aimed at saving energy and avoid waste. This project involved pupils of different levels and is a perfect example of a collaborative project that seeks to empower students to see themselves as actors in the world and to devise solutions to real life problems through the lens of the EU, EU of United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We have with us Elizabeth from the French National Support Organization and our winning teachers from Italy and Turkey. Elizabeth, will you tell us a little bit about the French uh, prize, the, the citizenship prize, sorry, and uh, why this project? Well, yes, uh, thank you very much. So first, uh, a really big congratulations to all of the teachers involved in this project, both the people who are here with us right now and also your many partners who I know weren't able to be with us tonight for different reasons. So I would like to thank you all for all of this wonderful work. Um, and I'd also like to uh, say that I'm presenting this prize on behalf also of the German National Support Service. Uh, the Citizenship Prize is a prize that we have co-sponsored for several years. Um, one of our goals that we, we care very deeply about is to encourage more each winning projects that seek to have an impact on local communities. Uh, many, we all agree that we are working um, towards goals of European citizenship and increased digital competencies and a feeling of being a European citizen, but also there is a huge potential for, um, for for kids and teachers to take that energy and all of those skills that you're developing and um, also turn it towards your local communities um, and to seek to engage uh, engage with uh, local organizations, local uh, retirement homes, with uh, food shelters, uh, with, with all sorts of um, social civil civil society in general. Um, and uh, we thought that this project really exemplified that goal and actually the first line of your project description spoke to us. Um, too often people tend to blame our indifferent society, but in doing that, we forget that we are society. Um, and that for us, the, that, that line just won our hearts right away. Um, and so uh, throughout the project, I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it involved lots of, lots of different, um, different student profiles, but the coding aspect was really lovely. But also, um, I guess the question that I would have for you is, um, how did this project help your students to develop um, a better recognition of their ability to act as citizens despite, um, despite their young age? Okay, thank you very much for the question. It's a very interesting one. Um, before I answer the question, uh, let me do that, Elizabeth, because I promised my students to thank you for choosing the, the project. Uh, thank you, it winning France, it winning Germany. Back to the question. Um, they definitely developed uh, uh, hard skills, soft skills, but this is a project uh, um, to raise awareness. They understood that each individual has a responsibility and that uh, not only in private life, because we wanted to export what is valid in private life, we wanted to export it into uh, at work because uh, uh, they have to build up an eco-friendly mentality. And so we wanted to develop hard skills, soft skills, awareness. But I have to say something, Elizabeth, that at the end of the day, we were in the middle of a nightmare, believe me, in the middle of a nightmare, especially in our region. And so we understood that uh, we learned something extremely, extremely important, which is resilience. If you really want to do something, and if you really believe in yourself, you can get, you can reach your objectives, and you can cope also with a very serious crisis. You can cope with nightmare. 
And so they learned something extremely important in this project. And this is why I wanted to start uh, mentioning the students because they are uh, why we are uh, uh, creating a twinning project for, for them to make them better students, better citizens. But in this case, we also, Nadia and I and Esma and all the other partners, we became better citizens and better teachers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. And next, we have the French Language Prize, sponsored by the French National Support Organization. And this prize goes to the project Leonardo da Vinci. The students work together on Leonardo da Vinci to break down stereotypes, fake news, and reflect on these artists without frontiers, interpreting it in a modern and creative way. During the COVID-19 emergency, the project didn't stop. The pupils enthusiastically welcomed initiatives aimed at supporting with creativity and a sense of responsibility the lockdown. And actually, we have here again with us Elizabeth, Elizabeth from the French National Support Organization, and Francesca from France, and Susanna from Italy. Congratulations for your prize. And as it's a French language prize, I think we will continue in France. Is it right? Yes. I know um, for the question that, but you can say a little bit, uh, Elizabeth, about the project firstly in English so everybody can understand. I plan to. Um, so to, to start off with the, the French language prize is uh, another prize that the French National Support Service has been sponsoring for many, many years um, in collaboration with the International Federation of French Language Teachers, La Fédération Internationale des Professeurs de Français, uh, and it's designed to promote projects that are run in French language. Uh, and the project that uh, Francesca and Susanna run was, uh, was just a wonderful example of um, a, a collaborative project, uh, a thematic project, projects uh, uh in investigating Leonardo da Vinci, uh, which is both has both cultural and linguistic and international implications. So we just thought this was a wonderful um, example of collaboration, but also of a, an interesting subject. Um, so uh, I will then ask my question en français. Uh, alors, qu'est-ce qui vous a emmené à choisir Leonardo da Vinci comme thème de projet? C'est assez rare. Um, et qu'est-ce que vos élèves ont appris à travers cette expérience? Alors, oui, bonsoir. Donc, euh, Léonard est décédé en 1519. Nous avons démarré ce projet en octobre 2019. Euh, nous avons décidé de travailler sur ce grand artiste, l'artiste le plus franco-italien qui soit. Léonard né, Léonard donné en Toscane est décédé en France. Euh, notre but, c'était d'en finir avec les, les idées reçues, les fake news concernant euh, sa, sa vie et son œuvre. Euh, nous avons composé 11 équipes internationales, donc dans lesquelles il y avait des élèves français, des élèves italiens. Euh, 11 équipes internationales, et nous avons proposé aux élèves de, de s'approprier et réinterpréter de manière moderne et créative plusieurs aspects de la vie de, de Leonardo da Vinci. Euh, des élèves euh, ont préparé, par exemple, une, euh, ils ont donné une voix, une vraie voix, au, au personnage peint par, euh, par Leonardo euh, via une application. Euh, D'autres élèves ont rédigé le bulletin scolaire de Leonardo, qui n'a jamais fréquenté l'école en réalité. Euh, D'autres euh, ont écrit le CV, que Léonard aurait pu envoyer au Seigneur de Milan pour se faire embaucher. Et on a fait une interview impossible et on l'a aussi adapté en bande dessinée. Et pour finir, des élèves ont préparé un quiz caout euh, sur, les, sur Léonard. Et grâce à ce quiz, le jour de la, du vernissage de notre exposition, parce qu'on a fait une exposition euh, dans, laquelle, dans laquelle on a exposé dans une médiathèque de Cannes toutes les productions d'élèves et des documents concernant notre euh, démarche de travail sur e-twinning. Donc le jour du, vernis, du vernissage, nous avons fait une, euh, un quiz caout grâce auquel tout le monde 
tous, les élèves, les enseignants, les parents, les employés municipaux ont pu tester leurs connaissances. Et en effet, l'enthousiasme des élèves et leur autonomie sur le, la plateforme TwinSpace nous ont encouragés à poursuivre ce projet après le vernissage. Et en effet, pendant la pandémie, donc pendant le confinement du printemps 2020, mmh. euh, nous avons continué de travailler avec, en distanciel avec nos équipes internationales euh, par visioconférence et sur la plateforme, sur ce thème, Léonard, et sur d'autres thèmes toujours euh, artistiques. Merci beaucoup et félicitations. Félicitations. Merci. Merci. Our next special prize is the Marie Skladowska Curie, sponsored by the Polish National Support Organization. And this prize goes to the project STEM is on fire. In this project, very young learners use STEM technology to learn about fire. Through experiments, research, robotics, mathematics, and other activities, kids learned all about this physical phenomenon. We have with us Pavel Czaplinski from the National Support Organization of Poland and the teachers from Greece, Italy and Turkey. Pavel, will you tell us a little bit more about uh, this award and why you selected a specific project? Of course. Uh, good evening, Irene. Good evening, winners and good evening, uh, all the winners following the, the conference. Uh, we have a honor to sponsor Maria Skłodowska Curie Prize uh, for the tenth um, uh, time in the it winning history and uh, and the prize was invented just in the honor to in the name of Maria Skłodowska Curie who was the great scientist and and the worldwide uh, achiever of of uh, of many interesting uh, things and we strongly believe that uh, teachers undertaking undertaking such uh, sophisticated projects uh, in the area of science are also very important for the education science and the all branch of economy uh, the project steam is on fire was is a project of a very high it winning quality standards and it meets all possible twinning criteria but apart from uh, from the um, the particle project quality uh, we were under a huge impression of the originality and of the methodology that teachers use in the project. How project partners use STEAM technology to learn about the fire. And here also is my uh, the question regarding the fire. Why the fire was the leading idea of the project, not other elements of nature, such, I don't know, water or air? That's quite interesting. So, uh, first of all, on behalf of all uh, members, students and teachers of the STEM is on fire project, we would like to thank you for this special prize. So fire is something dangerous that uh, kids love to discover. So uh, we, uh, th that was our team for uh, our project. And so we uh, performed many experiments with fire. Uh, one of our uh, concern, of course, it was uh, to, to teach children how to stay safe when performing an experiment with fire and always be under uh, supervision of an adult. So uh, fire, um, so sorry, children learned how to manage uh, fire, how uh, fire safety is uh, necessary, um, but also had so much fun because uh, they knew uh, that fire can be, um, uh, how to say, uh, under uh, their manage. Thank you. Thank you very much and congratulations once again. Next is li in line is the Peyo Yavorov Prize sponsored by the Bulgarian National Support Organization. And this prize goes to the project The Champion of the World. The students read the book The Champion of the World by Roald Dahl during the summer holidays. And when they went back to school in September, they watched the film discussed the story, drew the pictures, and dramatized a part of the book. The project developed the students' reading comprehension, critical thinking, and their potential for drawing, acting, directing, and filming to express their own point of view. We have with us Milena 
from the Bulgarian National Support Organization in the Human Resource Development Center, the National Erasmus Plus Agency for Bulgaria, and the teachers from Azerbaijan, Croatia, Romania, Turkey, and Ukraine. Milena, will you tell us some words about the project and why you sp selected the specific one for the prize? Uh, we cannot tell, listen to you if uh, you can try with your sound. Uh, can you please check because we have a, again, an issue with the sound that we cannot listen to you. So this project, as I said, uh, was really interesting and I have to say that it's a very important prize, the specific one, as it helps students to understand about reading and, uh, you know, comprehending and, you know, actually with all the technology we are talking about uh, media literacy, but before media literacy we also have to try to find a way for our students to learn and to love reading, which is really, really important. Uh, yes. We have a technical problem with all, yes? I think I heard something. Milena, can you try? Yes. Okay, great. That's great. Thank you. So, tell me. Next. Get Alex and Ramblings project during the year's winner in the Pili Avarov Special Prize category. The National Support Organization for Training Bulgaria is happy to congratulate you for your perfect, high-quality e-twinning work on the project encouraging the reading. The project The Champion of the World is based on the Raw Dahl's book Benny, the champion of the world. Different activities are very clear and very well structured. It means 11 countries, group communication, collaboration, illustration of the novel, competition with voting, and project work, and results. Co-presentation was Dear colleagues, for your teachers and for your students. Now I would like to ask you what kind of skills your students develop working on the Eton project, the champion of the world. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for the question, dear Milena. Uh, we are so proud to get the special prize for the project, The Champion of the World. Uh, first of all, I uh, uh, should say that all the students develop their reading skills, uh, as our project is based on the book, Dan is a Champion of the World by Roald Dahl. The students read the book in original, translated it into the native languages, uh, illustrated the book, shot a film according to the book, analyzed the book, characters and events, uh, made the story maps, created a lot of, a lot of resources um, and two blogs and a website of the book. Uh, going through all these activities, we can say that they increased their foreign language skills to ICT skills, to collaboration and communication skills, working uh, in international teams, uh, discussing the heroes, uh, and events expressing their uh, attitudes to the uh, to this or that event uh, of the book. All these could be done as a result of the enthusiasm and uh, creativity of our pro partners who worked uh, during a year on this project. Great thanks to them for their um, awesome work and uh, um, and also their support. Uh, and uh, thank you, it winning and congratulations. Congratulations to all. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. And last but not least, we have the Spanish Language Prize sponsored by the Spanish National Support Organization. And this prize goes to the project Surrealist. 
The key elements of the multidisciplinary surrealist project are a taste for the artistic, experimentation and the irrational through the discovery of surrealism, through activities like they created their own surrealist, landmarks, poems, zoo, uh, the golden ratio and surrealist music and dance. Its strength includes curriculum integration, the collaboration between partner schools and the use of technology, Activities are organized so that the students from different schools and nationalities discuss, engage and work towards a common goal. We have with us Julio Albalad Jimeno, INDEF Director in the Ministerio de Educación y Formación Profesional. Julio, excuse me for my Spanish, I know they're not perfect. And the teachers from Bulgaria, Spain, Tunisia and Ukraine. Congratulations to all. And Julio, will you tell us some words about uh, this prize and why you selected the specific project? Yes, of course. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, the Spanish language uh, prize is an example of the importance of promoting Spanish language and culture for the twinning. It allows teachers everywhere to share common interests and bring our language and culture to the classroom and students. This project is a clear example of this. Teachers from four different countries, as you said, that through an artistic movement of the 20th century have managed to promote its Spanish cultural language, learn and contact with people from other countries. In addition to expanding knowledge about the aspect of the common culture that we all Europeans share, like the surrealism movement. And uh, I suppose there is a question for the... Yeah, I have a yes. question. Yeah. Um, how has this project fostered the Spanish language and culture in the non-Spanish members? Okay. So, uh, thank you. Thanks for uh, your question and thank you for sponsoring this uh, Spanish prize. Um, muchas gracias, Shukra. So my name is Najwa Slatni and I'm greeting you from uh, the beautiful Tunisia. Our project is surrealist, so uh, I will answer your question in a surreal way. So I, I, I can say that uh, interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinarity and uh, collaboration, creativity are our ways to, uh, to develop the, these uh, uh, linguistic skills and to develop Spanish. So. Um, we engaged our students in various situations and challenges through creative activities such as writing and reading, that is poems, uh, surrealist too, with new animals adapted to climate change, uh, also uh, digital museums, uh, music and dance. We create music and uh, surreal music and we dance. Uh, in it, uh, teachers and students, and of course uh, here uh, the linguistic ski uh, skill was one of uh, of our objective, basic objective, because the Spanish was the basic language of our uh, project. So we uh, we can say that we succeed our aims, uh, especially uh, thanks to the good working atmosphere too. So uh, in uh, this project, Surrealist, we are not only uh, friends or partners, we are a big family. So all, we always say that we are a big family from Tunisia, from Spain, from Bulgaria, from uh, Ukraine. And uh, we really uh, share feelings. We, uh, we uh, celebrate events together. And uh, when a real travel was forbidden, we have crossed borders through our surrealist project. So um, at the end, I want to say that uh, we are uh, so happy of our project, of our work, of our students and of ourselves, of course, proud, of the, uh, proud and happy of this uh, prize. And of course, we are happy and proud of it winning. Thank That's you. All. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> the winning prize ceremony is coming to the end. I hope you all had the opportunity to get some ideas, to be inspired. Congratulations again to all, the, all our winners, but also to all the winners. All the winners for your great work, for your great projects you organize for your students. I'm sure that next year we will work again all these amazing projects you are running actually this school year. And I would like to say, don't forget, prizes, national quality labels, European quality labels are nice. 
but what is more viable in it winning is actually the great opportunity you offer to your students to meet, to share the European values, to collaborate and create common outcomes with their European peers. I hope you all enjoyed the evening with us. I wish you a good night and I hope you will have a really nice and fruitful time during the next two days for those who participate in the conference, in the annual conference. Good night to all. Thank you.